Hello everyone, welcome again. Thersites the Historian here. Tonight we're discussing the life and times of Confederate General Patrick Claiborne. Joining me tonight are Sean and a guest we'll call Pug. He is one of the moderators on Discord and a Civil War buff. And the plan of attack is approximately to go through Patrick Claiborne's life start to finish, talk about his various battles, and you know, get into some discussions about the interesting things that went along with the territory. I messed that part up a little bit, but we'll pretend I got it right. Okay, so, um, <laughs> Sean, how you doing tonight? Uh, okay, just very, uh, very, we're, we're very much knee-deep in the busy season. There's not enough tour guides to go around, so... You know, I actually I last today was the first day in five days I've had to turn down work because I'm constantly being asked to do extra tours right now. Are the tips pretty good or? Uh, mostly, mostly, yeah. All right, and uh, Pug, how are you doing this evening? And also, give us a tiny bit of information about your background and how you got interested in Claiborne. Yeah. Um, I, I'm doing well. Uh, I just got back uh, from uh, spring break. Uh, I should note that I am currently a uh, student of history at uh, Georgia Southern University, so uh, certainly not as uh, uh, well versed in uh, studies as uh, you know you two guys. Uh, but uh, I, I feel I have an amateur's uh, perspective of, of this, and this is kind of a subject that's been near and dear to me because. Uh, I, I think the reason I'm interested in the Civil War in the first place is because of Patrick Cleaver. Because uh, I remember one day back in eighth grade, uh, they had in one of my history courses this uh, uh, poster uh, detailing all these various Civil War generals. And you got Lee, uh, Jackson, obvious ones, guys like Wheeler, Leonidas Polk. And I, I kind of knew these, uh, most of these people from uh, reading a book or two from uh, the school library. But the one I did not know about was uh, Patrick Cleburne, and, and and I was interested, and so I led the little little blur, blur on it, on him, and uh, I was kind of shocked to, to read the line about how he apparently uh, proposed to uh, free the slaves for the Confederacy. That uh, kind of got me spiraling into learning about, about the guy through uh, Craig Simon's biography, and uh, along with the other. Uh, uh, Western Civil War history stuff, and uh, and yeah, I I I say that he may be the most interesting figure of the entire conflict uh, in terms of uh, the military figures of this war. It's interesting you bring that up. How I guess he sort of captured your imagination because I remember Sean. We went to a battlefield. I believe it was Perryville. And one of the guides there had what I assume is a homemade Patrick Claiborne sweatshirt. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, because I was pretty That's shocked at that. I'm like, uh, what? Why? Who does that? But apparently, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I was really, that guy. Well, I, I'd say there's a small cult around uh, Claiborne. Uh, he, he's well known among. Uh, uh, people that are in the Civil War community, pe people that are interested in these subjects. The problem is, I, I try to start a conversation in the general server I'm on, uh, unrelated to any history stuff, and no one recognizes his name. So, so yeah, he's uh, not a figure well known to uh, uh, Joe Public, compared to say like Lee or or uh, Sherman or Grant. <laughs> I'd say he's definitely one of the um, cult figures of the Civil War. Um, because, I mean, like, you know, like, I'm Sherman, Sherman Grant, Jackson Lee, uh, Forrest, these men all have their admirers. And when I say admirers, I mean, maybe maybe they may admire one aspect but not the other, but whatever, right? They all have admirers. And I'd say those five are, like, broadly known. Um, you might throw in, like, McClellan or Burnside, but only Burnside because everybody remembers those chops. <laughs> yeah, or or they you know, or they uh, think that uh, he he got he got shafted from Fredericksburg and it's like, oh he uh, he 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 didn't think he was a good good choice for command I, I, either. He was fairly humble, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember Hooker because like didn't the guy like 
Isn't that where we get the prostitute name from? I've I've I've, I've oh, yeah. like randomly the cool to say that. But yeah, Claiborne's one of those uh, one of the cult figures of the Civil War, and I mean a variety of people when it comes to the Civil War will have generals they like. And I was at the last one was at a Civil War conference thing. You know, some of those people were asking like, so "Who's your favorite obscure general?" You know, somebody's going to be like, you know, saying some shit like, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, oh god, who's that guy? Like uh, somebody like uh, Daniel Adams, who was a pretty crazy Confederate general. You know, people just say random things like that. But I feel like Claiborne really does have a cult, and I'm wondering, is there another Civil War general, or even just a figure who also has that kind of status, where we know that they're not broadly known, but they have like fans? Amongst the war historians, I'd say Hoke is the closest thing. Well, Hoke has a North Carolina that. cult, that's for sure. Remember, there was a a small bookstore. I think it was a Borders branded bookstore, but it had um, a, a biography of Hoke that still had the wrap on it. It was prominently displayed in the store, and I remember it stayed there for a couple years because we had visit our grandparents about every year and that book didn't move but uh yeah the people there knew he that he was one of the north carolina generals and i think on the back it says something that if something happened to lee in 1865 hoke would have been the new commander which is bullshit but apparently oh yeah 100 percent. he is one of the most junior officers in the confederacy at that point yeah, I, think he won, ranking. I think he won a siege at newburgh I mean. uh plymouth was uh, his uh, most famous battle yeah <clears throat> Uh, Which is kind of you know, basically gonna... the Battle of Baton Rouge, but uh, the Arkansas uh, San Jose actually work essentially. Yeah, I was just reading about that. Of course, with the, with the problem the Arkansas was, it wasn't ready, but they ordered it out anyway. And the commanders of the Arkansas actually protested about going out. And what do you know? The engines broke down like they said they were going to. But, you know, Van Dorn's an idiot. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Van Dorn. I. I, I... Uh, he, I, I find the guy probably the most entertaining figure of the war by far, but that's just me. He, he is pretty entertaining. There's no doubt about that. I was going to mention one too. You also have those generals who were failures that have defenders, and I'd say it's like Joseph e. Johnston, Braxton Bragg, George McClellan. When I say failures, it doesn't mean these guys didn't have talent or that it's the failure is entirely their fault. It's just that those men do have, they don't have a cult, but they maybe they do. I mean, I guess Hood is in there too. People who try to say like, oh, you misunderstand them. You know, I, Claiborne people never think he's misunderstood, is what I find. That's interesting. No. Yeah. So I'm trying to think if there's anybody else who's like a cult figure where they're not trying to make excuses for him. Maybe Dan and Sickles. I'm not... No, I think he goes in the Van Doren territory. People go like, "Oh, I've got a story for you," and then you know they, you know, they tell a Dan Sickles story. I think the, the people, <laughs> the people who like Dan Sickles, they don't try to pretend that he was some sort of genius, though. They're just content with what he was. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to be honest, I am a I Sickles fan, think... and I think he is the best general in in, in the East. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think that one that would have a potential to be that would be Beauregard, but there's a variety of reasons why it won't happen. Uh, one, just coming from a, what's a foreign culture of the era, so he's just not like the other generals, which could also help him, but also just the gaudy, over-the-top proclamations. I mean, I find him entertaining, but other people apparently don't. A um, bunch of stoddy Protestants. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, there, I feel like there's a Union one that I'm... That I'm um, that's very obvious when it hits me, and I'm going to be like, that's John the Gibbon. one. Are you talking about Chamberlain? Ooh, yeah, I think Chamberlain. That would be the one. That Chamberlain would be, Chamberlain's one of them. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Chamberlain is kind of like the Patrick Claiborne of the North. He's got a fan club. He's not broadly well-known, although he's better known just because of the movie Gettysburg and the book. Uh, but I'd say he's like that for the Union. Uh, John Gibbon, you mentioned. Uh, yeah, I could see that one too. Although to a less degree than the other two, I could see that with John Gibbon. Yeah, yeah. Now I think about it, uh, John Gibbon's more like the the AP Stewart in this scenario. <laughs> <laughs> AP 
AP Steel. Like, Solid straight. Commander, but just, just <laughs> nothing flashy about him, or really interesting, generally. Yeah, yeah, there's a few, th- there's a few things, uh, a few things interesting about Stewart, but Stewart overall is a little bit on the colorless side. Uh, one of the weirder ones is uh, Bushrod Johnson, just because he's a Quaker, and he'd been drawn oh, down. Oh, yeah, I love reading about him in uh, Dave Powell's uh, Chickamauga book. What do you say about him in the book? Um, apparently, uh, uh, he, he had, uh, some family issues, uh, uh, apparently, uh, part, uh, his, uh, wife oh, and yeah. kids, uh, thought, thought he was fighting for the union the entire time. They, they, they did not know he, he had went south and, and apparently he, he, uh, he kind of left his family after he realized his son had, uh, developmental issues and, uh, uh from his writings, oh, wow. uh, he, 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 you could tell from his writings that, you know, he didn't have a. A uh, very uh, positive view of uh, of uh, mental handicaps. Let's let's say, hmm. which was kind I of. I haven't, I haven't read much. True. Well, I mean, you know, your whatever your child is is not going to be able to do much. You know, uh, and you know, life's a lot harder back then too. But uh, the other two is. Um, I've read some of his diary in connection with Shiloh, and he does have an interesting entry, by the way. On March 31st, 1862, it was like four or five days for the battle, he writes in his diary, they're not entrenching, exclamation point, because he's actually the command, one of the commands closest to the Union camp. So he's one of the men who informs Beauregard that, hey, you know, they're not entrenching, and that's one of the reasons Beauregard attacks, is because he gets intelligence that they are not entrenching. So they've got a chance. Hmm. All right. So, uh... I guess maybe we can go circle back to the origins of Patrick Claiborne. Yeah, yeah, better get this started. Um, he's born in uh, Ireland, uh, Cork, Ireland, in uh, March 16th of 1828. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I, I often see it... I often see it written that... Uh, he was born on March seventeenth, you know, St. Patrick's Day, but uh, that seems to be a bit of a you know myth because of his, of his Irish heritage. Uh, but uh, it definitely was the sixteenth, possibly even the thirteenth, uh, given you know baptisms and whatnot. Uh, he, he was born to a very uh, middle class family, uh, unlike most other Irish immigrants of of the time period. He he wasn't Catholic; he was Anglican. And he came from a more well-off uh, family. Uh, par- apparently, uh, uh, when he was 11, his uh, father moved up and uh, be- uh, became a uh, landlord. Uh, so, yeah, not a uh, man of the people, certainly. Uh, he, uh, His father was a doctor, and so Cleburne was uh, sent to become an apprentice and hopefully get into a medical college. But, uh, because of the, because of the death of his father, along with, uh, his, uh, failing grades and the sorry, potato famine, uh, distracting his, uh, teacher, uh, he was unable to get, uh, get enough grades or get enough money to get into college. And so he, in 1846, he joined the British army totally, uh, left behind his uh, family, went under a fake name, and uh, uh, basically he tried to have. Uh, what he was trying to do was uh, join the forty first uh, regiment of foot, which was scheduled to go to uh, India, and hopefully just get get away from everything. Uh, you know, uh, join the army, see the world. The problem was. Uh, with, our, with all things of uh, young recruits joining the army. That didn't happen because his regiment was stationed uh, home side in Ireland, Ireland in order to uh, do garrison work during the whole troubles of uh, the uh, potato famine, which kind of sucked for uh, Cleburne. Apparently he was a decent soldier, managed to get up to the rank of corporal before he uh, was discharged in 1849. Uh, his surviving family members uh, uh, brought him along to uh, on board a ship over to the United States late in 1849. 
and uh, they moved uh, they moved first to Ohio, but he got a job uh, working for a uh, I, f- I forgot what it was a pharmacist down in Helena, Arkansas, whose name I can't remember, uh, but not really that important. Uh, he kind of makes his home in Helena, Arkansas there. And uh, he eventually becomes a uh, lawyer. And eventually he uh, becomes a political ally of the newly arrived uh, uh, Thomas C. Hindman, who I presume some of you you guys have uh, remembered and talked about prior. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Heinemann's uh, aggressive, uh, very colorful character. Probably the two most interesting oh, yeah. things about him is in Arkansas, he did a good job organizing troops in late 1862, although he pissed off a lot of people because he was so aggressive about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he, he was definitely, he was certainly like that back in uh, Helena. Surprisingly, he got a little oh. well to Cleburne, but, but what I need to get into this, this is the one thing I want to go into detail, detail about uh, the whole I think it was 1856, was it? I need to pull up the book real quick, but it was either uh, the elections of 1856 that uh, uh, Cleburne helped out uh, in uh, Helena on uh, Hyman's uh, campaign trail, giving speeches against the uh, the rising Know Nothing Party, uh, because obviously they they were very anti-Irish, anti-immigrant, and he could not stand for any of that, despite. I should note, though, that uh, he strongly, because of his, like, Irish birth and uh, whatnot, a lot of people, you know, heavily emphasize his, you know, Irish heritage uh, when uh, discussing him. I, I, I'd say there, there's merit to that, but it should be kept in mind. He's uh, he's, kind, he, he's kind of slightly detached from the whole Fenian, you know, Irish nationalism uh, sentiments that most would associate with Irishmen of this time, given his uh, more privileged background in the, the Irish middle class, which was a much smaller uh, commodity than, uh, you know, the uh, Catholic majority. Yeah. That's pre- very prevalent with Union generals like Thomas Sweeney, uh, Francis Meager, Michael Corcoran. Uh, Sweeney yeah, himself. Yeah, those guys. Like, yeah, Sweeney, like, led an invasion of Canada after the Civil War. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, that's a, that's something I need to read into because yeah, the Fenian stuff is is, is interesting. Uh, yeah, those those guys definitely come from a different uh, side of Ireland than uh, Cleburne did. I will say this real quick: probably easy in my top five favorite generals is Thomas Sweeney. Uh, he is one of the most over the top, violent characters of the Civil War. <laughs> he got into a fist fight with his commanding general. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember that the Battle of Bald Hill. That that is probably my favorite uh, right. battle to read about uh, in the Civil War. <laughs> at the at the end of the of that battle, he goes to the command tent and just starts punching General General Dodge. And the, the and the funniest part about that whole story is that he has only one arm, and he's beating the shit out of yeah. his commander with that one arm. <laughs> Yeah, which I'm not surprised about. The more I read about Dodge, the more disgusting of a figure he is. I mean, yeah. he was one of those kind of men who, like, when his soldiers like, can we just, like, burn random homes? He's like, yeah, cool. I mean, just just a despicable figure. Yeah. And corrupt to the core. And not very good at general, either. Anyway. <laughs> well, he was good enough at Bald Hill, though, though I kind of... Yeah, your grandmother could win that battle, man. You know, once the configuration like right of uh, General Walker, that that, that whole battle I could go on a whole rant. Okay, you go on around on that one. We'll do that one some other time. We'll do the Atlanta battles. Yeah. I, I I was still need to read the big oh, book I'd love on to it. That. Though. <laughs> uh, all right. Any, anyways, going back to uh, the whole political uh, uh, finagling, uh, Cleburne uh, was a strong supporter of uh, the Democrat the Democrat nominee, who happened to be his best friend, Thomas Hyman. Well, I say best friend, they were kind of, eh, there and there, at at times, depending. Uh, one day, I, I, I forget the date, I think it was March 24th, 1856. Uh, he's approached by Hinman, who, who asked him to uh, arm himself and to uh, escort him to 
uh, out to dinner because he insulted one of uh, one of the local know nothings, uh, someone who used to be a uh, Democrat, who he referred to as a mulatto. In this case, I'm referring to Tom Hinman here. Uh, referring to, I, I forget his name, something Dorsey Rice. Yeah, that's him. A anyways, he, he agrees to this and uh, takes two pistols. Uh, they, they are eventually confronted by Dorsey Rice and uh, his uh, brother-in-law, James Marriott, uh, in the streets of Helena. And Dorsey demands an apology from Heinemann, but Heinemann characteristically goes into a uh, uh, curse-fueled uh, rant against Dorsey. Eventually, Dorsey gets pissed off enough that he uh, shoots Hyman in the chest. Cleburne retaliates, pulls out, out uh, one of his guns, and shoots Marriott. Uh, Mar Marriott retaliates, shoots uh, Cleburne in the chest, and uh, a couple of gunshots are fired off, but uh, everyone backs off. Hyman recovers quickly, uh, Marriott is killed, is uh, mortally wounded, and uh, Cleburne barely survives. The bullet uh, was lodged right next to his spine, nearly severed it. Uh, he was he was lucky to be able to recover, and apparently uh, uh, he ha had uh, breathing issues for a long time afterwards. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those Wild West stories there. Uh, no, no one got uh, tried for anything. Uh, charges were dropped on all sides. And Cleburne, uh, uh, people didn't like uh, Thomas Hinton for what he did, but uh, because Cleburne was just, you know, uh, doing the honorable thing of just uh, helping his friend out, essentially, uh, he, he got uh, praised by the community. And it's because of all this that uh, he eventually, like, rose to become a local trial uh, major uh, figure in the community. Uh, so... So by the time the war starts, uh, uh, he's he's considered one of uh, the high, higher echelon people in Hela in Helena. And it's a, it's at this point that uh, because of his uh, relationship with the extremist know nothings, uh, that he eventually gets radicalized into uh, being a strong supporter of. Uh, southern nationalism and such. And so, when the Civil War starts, he becomes commander of the uh, the Yellow Rifles, the uh, Helena's uh, premier militia regiment, well, militia company. And eventually, this, uh, this company will be built up to a uh, regiment, the 15th Arkansas, not to be confused with the other two 15th Arkansas, because Arkansas is terrible at numbering units. Hmm. And uh, he's transferred to the command of uh, William J. Hardy over in uh, uh, Kentucky. Uh, he does some campaigning in uh, uh, during the winter of uh, 1861, mostly just marching around, uh, uh, occupying uh, small villages and such uh, in his local area. Getting supplies. Uh, he he doesn't do much until uh, uh, Shiloh, really, which is his first real battle. He's promoted in, I believe, March or is it early April uh, before or the battle to uh, Brigadier General and Permanent Command of the Brigade. I believe it's in March. Um, <clears throat> if you want me to, I can step in on this one. I'll let you go in on March. this this one because no, you, you, you are the local expert here in terms of that battle. Yeah. So, uh, Patrick Claiborne is, as a, is of course, uh, is under the command of William J. Hardy, which is the 3rd Army Corps. Uh, fun fact, it isn't actually a corps, it's just three brigades. But they wanted to keep the organization together, and Beauregard thought it might fool the Union and think they had more men. At this time, the Confederate Army, the... The, later on, the brigades would be very much state-based. I mean, not always, but typically, especially in Lee's army. Lee was really big on that, by the way. He really didn't like brigades to have, like, mixes of state regiments. But when the Confederates at Shiloh, they usually do. So he has 15th Arkansas, uh, 2nd, 5th, 23rd, and 24th Tennessee, and then the 6th Mississippi. 
uh, as well as some Arkansas artillery, although that's essentially commanded in a brigade by a guy named Francis Shoup, who was, uh, Francis Shoup uh, was a, uh, was from Indiana, and it went to the South, because he admired, apparently, their aristocratic pretensions. Uh, I've read some of Shoup's stuff, by the way, about the war, as Herman says, he's a really sarcastic fucker. Uh, but anyway, so, Claiborne's brigade is very large, like almost 3,000 men. And he's put on the very front line of the advance. So on April 4th, some of his men actually fight some of Sherman's men in a minor skirmish. Sherman ignores the warnings, though, so nothing else happens from that. On April 6th, Claiborne's brigade is one of the very first brigades to be engaged. The problem is, is that when he's it's, the problem is with the plan of attack, he's supposed to just push forward. And when he runs into Sherman's men, Sherman's men are able to start forming up. And Sherman's position is a very good defensive position. There's like a little creek going through. Um, Claiborne has some high ground, but Sherman has slightly higher ground, and he has some artillery. So very good defensive position. To make it even worse, there's a kind of swamp. A, like, right, like if you advance on Sherman's camp, there's a swamp that's right in front of the middle of Sherman's camp. So Claiborne attacked, and his brigade became divided. So the 6th Mississippi and the 23rd Tennessee tried to go across Rea Field, a field owned by an Irishman, while the other regiments attacked to the left through some very tangled woods. So the brigade gets divided. Now, the other four regiments, they try to attack through a wooded area uphill. They get mauled horribly. Uh, the highest-ranking brigade command, I mean, regiment commander there was uh, William Bate, who later became a um, division commander in the Army of Tennessee. Uh, Bate's pretty much incompetent, by the way, when he gets promoted. Oh to yeah, mission, but he's okay. I yeah. hate that he's guy. Okay at regiment, what? Yeah. We'll, we'll oh yeah, no, he's, yeah, no, no. He, Bate, Bate is uh, um, God amongst me and the other Army of Tennessee nerds. Like Bate is definitely like held in low regard, um, but he's fine at regiment. And there's actually an interesting story. What happens with Bate is. One thing that actually is kind of sad about Bate is a lot of his family served with him and died in the war. So his brother was with him at Shiloh, and Bate, before they were going to go in, lit a cigar, and then his brother died next to him. He never smoked a cigar again. People said he would actually grab a cigar, put it in his mouth, and then stop. He could never do it again. Uh, he also got horribly wounded, and they were going to saw off his leg, and he pulled a gun out and was like, if you saw off my leg, I shoot you. So they didn't, and he did survive. Anyway, those regiments get mauled. Uh, the other two, Claiborne leads into the attack through Rea Field, but they come under a lot of musket fire, a little bit of artillery fire as well. They strike several times. The 23rd Tennessee eventually won't go any further. The 6th Mississippi makes several attacks and suffers some of the worst percentage losses of a regiment ever in the Civil War, 70% losses in only like 15 to 20 minutes. Afterwards, it became known as the Bloody Sixth. <coughs> so Claiborne's brigade is wrecked very early on in the fighting. And he does, some of the regiments do take part in eventually pushing Sherman away from his encampment. But that's really going to be the doing more of the brigades that come after him, like Patton Anderson, Robert Russell, and especially Bushrod Johnson. Uh, here's what's interesting, though, I found in my own research. After that, all that happens, Claiborne eventually organizes a few of his regiments that he can. Um, the 6th Mississippi and the 2nd Tennessee are considered to be blown to pieces, so they're not in anymore. So 15th Arkansas and 5th, 23rd, and 24th Tennessee. He forms those groups. You only get about 800 to 1,000 men together. And Claiborne starts attacking toward the Union Center alone, and you'd think he's going to get slaughtered. But his brigade uses terrain very effectively and he strikes the Union constantly on their flanks. So he actually turn, turns the flank on two different Union defensive lines late on the first day of the battle and causes heavy losses. I've read a lot of Union accounts of those regiments. They say hail of bullets. We were sent reeling. And to be fair, a lot of these units are also themselves depleted, low in ammunition. They've been fighting all day. So he's doing really well, and he's actually preparing to attack Pittsburgh Landing. 
And what I found in my research is the area that he's going to attack, there's almost nobody there. Now, I'm not telling you Claiborne's one depleted brigade is going to attack and rout the whole Union Army and win the day. Considering everything else, that, considering everything else and the strength of the Union position, what I'm saying is that he was in a position to do even more damage and... A few officers, including Hardy, and actually one of the uh, one of Claiborne's um, subordinates, who left this very detailed account of what the brigade did on their first day of Shiloh. I mean, it's one it's one of the best finds I've gotten in my research. He makes it clear that if they had kept going, they would have taken Pittsburgh Landing. I have a lot of doubts about that, but no doubt they would have done a lot more damage. Uh, anyway, so brigade falls back, and then the day. Um, Claiborne, in his official report, notes that as the Union gunboats were firing that night, they actually didn't hit his men, they hit their own men, uh, which he was absolutely horrified about. Next day, he reforms his command, goes out in the front lines. <clears throat> um, he's holding his position. When Braxton Bragg, because the what happened is they had repulsed a, a Union attack around Jones Field, Braxton Bragg ordered several brigades to attack. Claiborne protests and says, I don't have a lot of men here. We've only just repulsed them, but Bragg was a very aggressive commander. He's ordered forward. Claiborne's brigade is torn to pieces. Uh, the whole thing melts. He says afterwards he can only rally like 50 men. And with those 50 men, he launches a small counterattack that makes the Union kind of stagger back a bit because it's all being fought in very tangled terrain. But after that, his brigade's out of the fight. Although in that one attack, he laments in his report that he loses one of his best friends, Archibald Patton, who was the uh, second command of the 15th Arkansas. Uh, I mention all this because the in detail, but also because besides knowing it, it's also that the standard narrative on Claiborne at Shiloh is that he didn't do very well. And I think that's true about the first attack for sure, but it's also his first time in major combat. And, I mean, he made mistakes there for sure, but what's interesting is that after the battle, he really studied those mistakes, and he determined that they needed light infantry companies with each regiment who were taught to fight as sharpshooters and skirmishers. That's an innovation. I, I'm not, when I say innovation, I mean, that idea has been around a while, but a lot of Confederate units didn't have that. You know, there's an entire book that I've read that essentially explains the Army of Tennessee was... One of the reasons it failed was that there was not a lot of tactical innovation. Guys like A.P. Stewart, sure, they're, they're solid officers, but they're not very imaginative. Um, but Claiborne does start making tactical adjustments after Shiloh and spent his time after the battle studying what had happened. And I think he got the idea about the light infantry stuff working well because that's, he used similar types of units in that late first day attack that worked really well. I think that's where he gets the idea from. And I would say, for a commander whose brigade got blown to pieces and he didn't do very well in the morning, he did really well in the afternoon. So uh, I'm actually kind of impressed with him at Shiloh. And also, like, he told Bragg that attack won't work, and he was absolutely correct. So I um, I, I take the different view. I think, uh, I think at, when you get beyond the morning attack, Claiborne does very well at Shiloh and is learning very quickly. So that's into my uh, sh detailed Shiloh discussion. All right. Well, uh, it's, it's a good thing that uh, you ended uh, with that because that kind of touches on uh, pro probably uh, actually actually we should probably get into his innovations like once he gets a division command. Uh, but but yeah, that is one of the big thing that that he does that uh, impresses me uh, that that he is willing to innovate that that he's not well. He's not just going to stagnate with uh, his tactics, uh, going from one battle to another. I, 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 hold, hold on, I'm kind of gathering my thoughts here. All right. As, after uh, that battle, uh, uh, the army withdraws to Corinth, of course, and so uh, his commands reorganized due to the Conscription Act. Uh, regiments gets uh, filtered out of his brigade. He starts forming the uh, aforementioned uh, light infantry units, skirmisher companies, and he starts. Uh, I think he also forms a dedicated uh, 
Shark Shooter Company for the entire brigade uh, by, the, by this point. Uh, later on, he'll eventually uh, expand this to uh, his division and arm some of them with uh, Whitworth and Kier rifles, some of the uh, best uh, long-range rifles available at the time. Uh, he uh, engages in the Battle of Farmington around uh, around Corinth, which doesn't go too well. It's a small action, uh, and, he, and he struggles with some of his uh, subordinates who weren't up to the task. And then he's transferred uh, with his brigade and, an, and another uh, under uh, Colonel Preston Smith uh, and forms a provisional division and joins uh, Kirby Smith's invasion of Kentucky. With this force, he uh, fights at the Battle of Richmond, where uh, he helps set up, uh, alongside uh, General Thomas Churchill and uh, Kirby Smith, eventually, uh, they all but destroy a 5,000-strong uh, uh, Union force, nearly capturing it entirely. Uh, should be noted, though, that uh, as much as a uh, victory as it was, it was against... Uh, Second-rate uh, militia-esque units, uh, poorly led, poorly armed. Uh, that that said, he was fighting somewhat outnumbered initially uh, and defensively uh, before uh, reinforcements arrived to uh, launch a counterattack the second day. Uh, that that said, he he was wounded uh, quite early on in the uh, in the in the battle, uh, shot through the mouth apparently lost a few teeth, and uh, he spent about a month recovering. It's And it's during this time that uh, he eventually grows out his beard that you see in most uh, images. Uh, I need to pull this up, but uh, uh, there, there's one photo around of, uh, of uh, Cleburne, I believe, in 1861 uh, without the beard. Hold up. I, I, I'm going to show this just so there's... Even without the beard, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's an inside joke on a uh, on another server of mine. I'm with uh, another history YouTube cha channel. Uh, the guys keep on goofing about this as if some like cursed item. We'll see if we can find it. I, I posted it in your uh, DMs. Oh, on, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. If there's any place for me to post images for the for uh, the stream. Uh, let me know. All right. Uh, if uh, the is good. Yeah, there there's a belay text that should be visible to you now on the server. So this is Claiborne without the beard. Not uh, definitely looks different without it. So when did he grow the beard? You said. Uh. The uh, the battle occurred August 31st, 1862, so uh, between that and, uh, so over the month of September, uh, essentially. Okay. Uh, eventually he does return to command, but the division was broken up, and, uh, and, uh, he was resumed to brigade command. Oh, pardon and, me, real quick question here. Uh, where is that Claiborne without the beard picture? Exactly. Oh, hold, hold on. I'll, I'll go post it over in uh, the Boule text. Okay, I just know, I want to know where it is because I'd like to put it in the Shiloh book and be like, hey, this is what Claiborne looked like at Shiloh. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the exact gonna... source of it, but but I know that it's also in the Great Simon book and uh, in the uh, image section in the middle, like all uh, Civil okay. War books do nowadays. Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, well, yeah, a lot of, actually, a lot of them nowadays like to disperse them throughout, but, okay, it's in the Craig Simon one, I'm gonna go take a look at that, uh, I've got that on the shelf, because, um, um, like, one of the things I have in the Shiloh book is Grant as he looked at Shiloh, which is not how he usually looked, like, his beard was longer, it was more rectangular, and he actually went to battle in a, in a um, almost full-dress uniform, like, sash and everything, like, you know, because you always think about Grant as being simply dressed, not at Shiloh. He's dressed fancy. So had he been defeated at Shiloh or had his career ended, then our image of Grant would be as a guy dressed to the nines. It would be an image <laughs> of a guy dressed to the nines with a rectangular beard. Exactly. 
Uh, the whole like you know shorter beard. I think his wife visited him and essentially said I like the shorter beard. I think he grew it out when he was on campaign, and then he just started wearing simpler uniforms. But I think some of that was like a showman thing. Like I think he was trying to figure out like what looks better for my image. Yeah, it's a sort of uh, playing humble and pretending he doesn't care about the bells and whistles. Had a little bit more political oomph to it. Yeah, I think when you order the finest silverware in Europe to be in the White House and you're the first person to do it, you care about the bells and whistles and how you look. That's just my theory. Yeah, the uh, right. humility game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a nice thing I, I, I've kind of, kind of learned from reading up on uh, Grant. It's, it's kind of taken away the, uh, the current modern mystique uh, surrounding him. Which I, I'm kind of finding dis disgusting over time as people constantly are, tr are trying to find like defenses of uh, a lot of his uh, stupid shit that he's that he's done. Like uh, General Order uh, Number Eleven. Uh, actually, I don't think I see any defenses of that aside from oh 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 uh, that was just a mistake. Uh, after, after that, he 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 constantly apologized I, 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 for it, and he felt really bad for doing that. Is that the one about uh, throwing out Jews? Yeah, yeah, that one. The the, the most anti, probably the most egregious anti-Semitic act uh, in American history. <laughs> yeah, which you know, compared to other countries, means we must be on the on the softer side, right? Yeah, uh, but you know, generally, uh, yeah. But, you know, it's, but no, it, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's Grant. Um, from what I've, from my research shows, the idea that he freed his slaves seems to be wrong. It looks like he sold them, the one slave he had. Um, but I need to check on that one. Uh, so yeah, don't quote me on that one, but I want to check on that one again. But yeah, it, it's, I, I mean, there was also there was a lot of cotton speculation going on in Grant's section. Like a lot of his like friends and relatives got wealthy. I mean, that was pretty par for the course, though. To be fair, especially out west, like along the Mississippi, you know. Yeah, especially funny though late, later on in his career when uh, corruption became his uh, middle name. He placed the yeah, S. Yeah, and there was well, they always defend him and say that he didn't know, and I'm like, nah, he knew. He just was the kind of guy who's like, if he was your friend, he was going to defend you to the end. Yeah, yeah, he fired the guy that uh, took down the clan because he was looking into railroad into uh, his railroad uh, schemes. Exactly. I tell people that who tell me like Grant smashed the clan and like yeah, and then he fired the guy a few months later because he looked into corrupt practices. But look, we all know PMCs have no problem with corruption. In fact, their complaint is they're not in on it. Pretty much. Yeah. And anyways, we probably should get back on topic. Um. <laughs> so, so yeah, Grant's a topic on its own, man. <laughs> all right. Well, back on to Kleber who. Uh, has a, who never really got as far as uh, Grant did in terms of uh, rising through uh, po uh, politics and such. Uh, Cle uh, Cleburne managed to somehow recover quite rapidly and came back to uh, to the field uh, before the Battle of Perryville. I, I, I'm not going to say much about the battle. It's been a while since I read that uh, part of the book of uh, uh, reread the biography. Um, or read up on the battle itself. I, I just know it's absolutely insane be because uh, Bragg launches an attack on a uh, on one of the flanks of uh, Buell's army, thinking that it's just an isolated portion instead of the entire, uh, and doesn't know that the entire ar army is uh, nearby. He somehow wins and overruns uh, McCook's corps, uh, but eventually finds out the truth that uh, uh, he's outnumbered three to one, pulls back. Cleburne does quite well in this battle, uh, leading a charge with his 800-strong man uh, brigade, uh, piercing uh, the enemy line. And uh, it's for, for this and his prior actions that he's promoted in uh, November, I believe, of 1862, Maybe in early December. I need to check this again. Uh, to Major General, given command of uh, of uh, a division. Yeah, he is November. 
Um, yeah, I want to say one thing about Perryville. You said you're kind of wondering why they overran the flank. I think the answer you already gave, it's called Alexander McCook. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah, 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 that's that that's a good enough reason as any. I, what was he called? Chucklehead? He called himself Gut? Um, oh, boy. Perry's good at swearing and singing, though. Yep. McCook seems to have been a solid enough division commander, but he was promoted. The guy was really young. He's promoted beyond his capabilities. Should also be kept in mind those troops they overran. Some of them had had were very they were very poorly trained. And, oh yeah, raw recruits. Yeah, a, a lot of these sure guys were they were recruited like the month before uh, Mustard of yeah. Service. Uh, two, their two commanders were very unpopular. Like they were both. Um, oh yeah, Terrell uh, and uh, James S. Jackson yeah. were they. Yeah, unpopular guys. Uh, Terrell, Terrell, by the way, when they met Terrell, though, just say real quick, superb artillery commander. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Five, fantastic. But that he's in command of regular artillery. They put him in charge of volunteers. He was just a total terror. You know, he just, he didn't understand how to handle uh, non-professional soldiers. So, yeah, so, no, yeah, he did very well at Perryville. But, yeah, they became a division command now for, uh, for his efforts. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I... Well, Taking a tangent back to uh, to uh, that whole thing, uh, I, I remember hearing uh, the story of uh, James Jackson, uh, Terrell, and uh, the, the other brigade commander in that division. Before the battle, they, they had a conversation over uh, breakfast uh, talking about how unlikely it is uh, for a uh, commanding officer to die in battle. And guess what? All three men died in that battle. Yeah, the other one was, uh, I believe it was Colonel Webster. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they all died. That's uh, I um, I, I think it was in battles and leaders because I I tried to find the actual I tried to find originally where that story came from. Yeah, it's pretty creepy, but yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess we should get into uh, Cleburne's uh, command style and uh, his his personality now because I think that's going to start getting re relevant. Uh, Cleburne's uh, on a personal level, he seems. Uh, quite reserved, or I should say, quite uh, socially uh, anxious. I, I guess he, he doesn't seem to to uh, take too well to uh, society, societal stuff. Uh, for, like for one, as I pointed out earlier, uh, he 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 was no equestrian. He, he could barely ride a horse. Uh, he struggled to us. Uh, uh, Riding from command post to command post, he struggled to to stop his uh, mount uh, in time, uh, time and time again. And, and, and apparently, on like a personal level, sometimes he'd be a, a bit of an awkward uh, speaker in the you know refined settings like uh, dinners and whatnot. Uh. Uh, in terms of camp life, uh, I, I, I recall, I think, wasn't it Liddell who uh, spoke about how uh, uh, he slept uh, with, with a freaking raccoon or something? I think so. I think so. Um, I know him and Liddell had an interesting relation, had a kind oh, of yeah, conflicted certainly. relationship. But uh, to be fair, Liddell seems to have had a conflicted relationship with he, literally everybody, which might be yeah, why he's getting shot at the war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Liddell. L Liddell's one of one of the more interesting um, officers in the in the, in the, the Western Theater. Uh, yeah. in, that, in that regard, he, he's he's one of the most opinionated guys. Uh, one of the few guys that uh, uh, didn't really hate Bragg. It seemed uh, was probably why he got a division at uh, Chickamauga. The guys who tend not to hate Bragg are his Pensacola associates. Like Chalmers, Withers, um, those guys. Uh, Gladden was another one. He died at Shiloh. Yeah. Uh, um, J. J. Patton Anderson. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He liked Bragg as well. So there was like a Bragg clique. They tend to be brigade and regiment commanders, and they tended to be uh, Pensacola associates. Um, <clears throat> you know, but Bragg took an instant dislike to Polk because he thought Polk was incompetent, which he was. He saw his men were poorly. He thought his men were poorly drilled. He was kind of right about that, but he overstated it. But he was horrified by them when he first saw Polk's corps before Shiloh. He said, "It's not. It's not a." He said, "They aren't soldiers. They're a mob." 
And, you know, I mean, true, there was some poor discipline. And uh, I read about one account where the 13th Louisiana, like, some officer tried to stop him from drinking, so they shot him. <laughs> you know, things like that, right? But, um, you know, it, it's just very... Uh, the problem with Bragg was he, he, his opinions that he would form would be severe and unchanging, and that could really uh, blindside him to a lot of things. But anyway, yeah. So Lydell's one of the few um, uh, supporters that he has. And uh, Lydell and Claiborne actually did... Uh, Lydell in his uh, account says that he used some Claiborne used to talk, and Claiborne brought up to him the idea of freeing slaves for combat. Oh, oh, oh when yeah, Hitler. and apparently they, they yeah. both agreed on it, which is, uh, which is odd in uh, Liddell's case, given uh, the fact that he is a slave owner. Yeah, I, I think that it's odd because you're right, because a lot of the officers who are going to be more opposed to it when Claiborne actually mentions it tend to be slave owners, although some, I mean, tend to be slavers, the ones who are opposed to it. I'm kind of not surprised, though, with Liddell. In his account, he seems more ambivalent about slavery than the other ones. And also, he's very, very intelligent. And my kind of thesis is um, a lot of people who are like more horrified by Claiborne's proposals are people who are more hidebound, or in some cases might actually be kind of stupid. <laughs> and I think somebody yeah. like Liddell is. Adele was intelligent and I think was more a Southern nationalist. Yeah, sense, yeah, you know, I, I can I can make that case for a guy like Bates. Dude, dude's a complete moron, and, and, and he yeah, also happens to, to disagree with Cleaver on that and call, and think that the dude was an abolitionist for justice. Like uh, Bates, Stewart, Anderson, none of these men are particularly uh, known for their. Uh, they're all kind of rigid thinkers, though. Bates kind of the dumber side, but. Uh, this is for you. Uh, this is for you, Thersites. Uh, Bate had a newspaper before the Civil War called the Tenth Legion. Wow! Named after the C after Caesar's unit. I mean, why would you name a newspaper after the Tenth Legion, though? What's the rationale? I haven't read an issue to let to to know, but I have occasionally run into newspapers with some pretty esoteric titles. I think even Lou Wallace might have run a newspaper that also had a weird title like that. But yeah, so he had a newspaper called Tenth Legion. I mean, I don't know. I guess he was a fanboy, right? Must have been. I mean, I, I can only imagine what his YouTube username would have been if he had been around today. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Coach, you know, saying that, what if, uh, what, what, what if his newspaper had called the Theban Sacred Band? How about that? <laughs> well, in that case, oh. in that case, the problem. Okay, is that, in that case, you'd have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, in that case, people would have been raising eyebrows because they would know. You get in trouble back then. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be one of those things where polite society people would give them the eyebrow in the street because they'd eventually ask somebody, oh, I read the Theban Sacred Brand, such a marvelous paper. You know that was a bunch of gay dudes, right? <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah, you do get... Oh, no, no, I mean, no guys, they were all platonic. Yeah, Be I mean, Beauregard makes references to Julius Caesar and his account of the Mexican-American War. Uh, one that I get a mention, one that I see a lot being mentioned in Civil War accounts is uh, Xenophon. Also, God, you read Richard Taylor, uh, his Destruction and Reconstruction. It's just classical and historical references over and over and over and over again. He said Grant's military abilities were the equivalent of Marshal Villiers, the one who, um, who uh, you know, fought at Malpaquet and um, other battles of the War of the Spanish Succession. You know, things like that. You know, he's, he just wants to impress you with how intelligent he is. It sounds like he was sort of in the late antique school of writing history. We have to make as many classical illusions as you can just to basically show how much you've read. Yes, but he makes them very broad. So you got the classical and you have things that would be almost up to the uh, in the historical references to Napoleon. So it's very, very broad. But um, he was a very intelligent, well-read man, you know. Anyway, I guess we're done with the asides here. They're fun, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and anyways, regarding uh, 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 Cleveland and his division, uh, going into uh, the December campaign around uh, Murfreesboro, uh, he had under his immediate command uh, uh, four brigades. Uh, Sam Woods, uh, Bay, which had been reorganized from its form back at uh, Shiloh, same commander. Uh, Liddell's brigade, which was made up of Arkansas's, bailed around Hyman's brigade. There, 
Lucius Polk, who uh, commanded Cleburne's old, old brigade, and uh, Bush Rob Johnson, who commanded a brigade of uh, Tennessean troops. Uh, uh, Bush Rob Johnson would uh, be transferred soon soon after, and uh, and uh, we'll get into uh, the unit that replaces his command, but uh, uh, this is the formation that he takes into uh, Murfreesboro. Uh, uh, on December 31st, he's... Uh, he takes part in Hardy's uh, far left flank assault alongside uh, McCown's division, and uh, he he is pivotal in uh, breaking McCook's flank and uh, sending his corps to rout. Uh, Cleburne makes about three uh, ma- breaks three uh, defensive lines that the the Union put up. Uh, I believe it was uh, McCook's first line. Then Sheridan's defense eventually, though that's a bloodbath. And uh, I forget the third line, but eventually they, his commanders stopped before they reached the uh, the pike, uh, mostly due to exhaustion. Though a few men briefly gained the pike, uh, though though of course they were eventually pushed off in a counterattack. Uh, so by the end of the first day, he he's gained a remarkable amount of ground, at, though at heavy cost relatively heavy cost compared compared to his other uh, division commanders uh, especially in Polk's corps uh, he, he got off lightly uh, of course he's unengaged for uh, the next two days as uh, Brad focuses, focuses all of his attention on his right flank with uh, Breckenridge which goes poorly uh, eventually uh, Bragg decides to uh, fall back from Mur- Murfreesboro Realizing the battle's lost and uh, Rosecrans may get reinforced and he'll be isolated. And this is where things get uh, a bit more complicated between Kleber and uh, Bragg, as uh, as uh, Sean is kind of hinting at. Uh, around this time, I forget the name of the paper, but some Southern newspaper was very critical of Bragg's performance in, in this battle and blamed him for the defeats. Uh, Bragg... He, was pissed off at this and issued an order to the army, which I believe said asked his commanders to uh, write their own accounts to the paper to contest uh, their uh, faulty uh, account. And and he made the mistake of asking his commanders if they considered him worthy of command. Uh, did, I, did I get that, that right, Sean? Uh, I, I think you mentioned this before, talking about uh, Bragg a while back. Uh, yes, you are. Uh, you're essentially correct. Um, it's it's very bizarre. Uh, Certainly behavior. is. Yeah, yeah, and and it's yeah. about this point I think that Bragg's uh, issues with the army are, become basically unfixable because basically every single corps and division commander under his command, uh, all of them signed a petition requesting that he be removed. Including this includes Cleveland, who uh, backs Hardy uh, in his in his position against uh, Bragg. Despite, despite not quite center. right. Not quite correct. They don't all sign a petition. Right, That's... right. There's a few like uh, Chalm- Chalmers, I believe. There's, uh, I think Cheatham didn't, no, didn't Chalmers, sign Chalmers. it. Cheatham didn't, and actually, uh, some uh, Claiborne called him Weathers, out. Weathers, Weathers. That's a division commander at the time. That's, yeah. Withers did not there. sign. Withers did not sign it. Chalmers did not. Those the Pensacola associates, so they don't. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So when Cheatham, when yeah, when, when yeah, Cheatham backs down about it. The the only one who's ex- really explicit with it is Polk. I mean, Breckenridge is just pissed. Um, the way the way Bragg tries to undermine Breckenridge is by trying to get one of his colonels promoted to general. And Bragg's trying to get him over his side to be like, hey, if you support me, I'll make you general. That was a, a general, Tra- I'm sorry, Colonel Trabu, but then he died within a few weeks of, um, I don't want to say it was yellow fever, but it was something that got him. And anyway, so, yeah, um, yeah so it's, uh, it, it's the, the exactness of the petition who signed it, it's been a while since I read about it to know precisely everybody's position, but it's not like as united a front as you think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I will play, play that a bit. I, I, I recall that there were some holdouts. Um, but, but it was... Claiborne used, 
Claiborne said that he 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 kind of told he made he was more circumspect with Bragg. He said something like, "I know that you're a brave soldier and devoted to the cause, but I don't think you should be in command." You know, so he uh, he went out of his way to praise Bragg because nobody doubted Bragg's you know courage, devotion, or that he had certain skills. So he he tried to um, soften the blow. Yeah, yeah, which probably explains why uh, he didn't get as heavily punished at this time as, uh, say, the Cown, who uh, gets basically uh, sh shafted out of the army. Yeah, I, I honestly think, you know, McCown had a bunch of other problems, too. I mean, he was given, he he'd, he'd not handled his division very well. He was given to panic. Him and Jefferson Davis did not like each other, so he's already kind of politically on the outs. Um, I honestly think the main reason bragging over Claiborne is he thinks Polk, McCown, are incompetent, and they are. He thinks Hardy is, Bragg thought Hardy was like a true soldier and fairly competent. But he doesn't. He doesn't think he's like amazing. He's correct. Um, Agreed. He thought, yeah, he didn't. He didn't have the highest opinion of Cheatham, and I think Cheatham probably division was about the ceiling on him anyway. I you know, the one thing I can say about Bragg is that his opinion of a lot of his officers, I think, was usually dead on, um, with a few exceptions. I think Claiborne, it, he just Bragg was was actually like, no, you're an amazing officer. I really wish I had your support, but he's not going to because. He doesn't have uh, Hardy's support. Although, keep it in mind, that's it. Hardy was less explicit than Polk, for sure. And any time yeah, Polk yeah, would try to get Hardy like to more front, Hardy would be like, I don't want to do that. You know? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, you know, Claiborne kind of softened the blow, and Bragg praises his military abilities all the time. Interesting. Well, well, continuing on, uh, of course, this position goes nowhere, and Bragg remains in command. Uh, uh, I, I have heard speculation that uh, uh, Stonewall Jackson was briefly considered by Davis to take command in uh, the Army of the Tennessee. Is that is that was that an actual thing, or is that just some mythos? Uh, probably a mythos. I know Davis brought up to Robert E. Lee about Lee taking over once or twice. Uh, but yeah, there was no way in hell that was going to happen. Um, you know, the, the, you run into the problem. What essentially happens with Bragg is Jefferson Davis, after Stones River, decides, I want to remove Bragg, but who should replace him? He asks Lee. Lee says, put Beauregard in command. Which Lee says to Davis all the time. Davis always goes, no, nah, yeah. I'm not doing that. I hate him. I mean, sure, he's like my second best general, but now nah, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so who are you going to go with? Joe Johnson's Johnson the only other offer. Right. Polk and says he's, as and he's terrible. He's terrible, but at this time, Davis distrusts him, but not fully. So at this time, Johnston is the theater commander, a position he's, he hated, and said, I can't really do anything here. And when Davis would say, yeah, you can, he would ignore it anyway because he's Johnston. Um, he just looks for excuses not to do anything. So Davis has Johnston go inspect Bragg's army, and he says to Johnston, essentially he's like saying, like, remove Bragg. And Johnston keeps refusing. He would cite the fact that at one point Bragg's wife was very sick, and Bragg was very much devoted to his wife. Uh, his letters to her are very, some of the most very, some of the most, some of the most honest letters I've ever read by a Civil War general. Um, and Johnston kept being like, I don't know if I should take over. Because he didn't want to. And Johnston thought that the idea that he's a theater commander would go there and remove him, he said, would be untoward. And I think there's some truth in that, but also just Johnston's allergic to taking action. And he just refuses to take over, and then you have the crisis at Vicksburg, and Johnston leaves to go organize the army at Vicksburg that does nothing. Because um, <laughs> you know, that's what Johnston does. No, no, oh, it's yeah, called the it. Army of Relief was, was the name I commonly hear for that, which is probably the worst name for any army in, in this war. Pretty bad name. Uh, you know, there's, there's Timothy B. Smith argues that Johnston gave up Vicksburg and then didn't, and only did moves that were perfunctory. 
Uh, I found in my own Port Hudson research that one of the officers around Port Hudson said, hey, Banks' army is in horrible condition. I have enough supplies to support ten to 12,000 soldiers. Send them down here, and we'll, 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 we'll fuck these guys up. And I think they would have won. But it's Johnston. He doesn't really like doing anything. You know, I mean, he makes, yeah. he makes, I mean, really, compared to, compared to Johnston, McClellan is a lightning bolt. Uh, so Johnston just refuses to take over. Bragg remains in command. So there was always this myth that, you know, Davis loved Bragg and kept him in. It's just not true. They actually didn't like each other when the war first started. Davis came to admire Bragg's devotion. And Bragg was a very good subordinate. He just, he had this ability just to win over his superiors. And he won over Johnston as he did Albert City Johnston, as he did Beauregard, as he did anybody who was a superior. Um, but a lot of this is about the fact that Johnston won't take over and the Confederacy it just doesn't have a lot of good independent commanders. They just don't have a very deep talent pool to draw from. You know, and when you're outnumbered the way they are as well, you and you have a society of very prickly men, some of whom own other humans, it's going to take somebody of superhuman ability to keep the army together and win battles, and somebody like Robert E. Lee. Uh, you know, I would say to a lesser degree Beauregard. They, they had the chops for that. A guy like Bragg doesn't, and I'm sad to say, I don't know who they can replace him with. So Davis, by not by his own choice, is stuck with him. Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah, bad. To, to, anyway. Yeah, to the detriment of, uh, you know, Confederacy existence, which I, I guess in the uh, current long term should be considered a uh, a good thing, considering what the Confederacy stood for overall. The, um, I guess say, the, um, I would say probably one of the biggest detriments to the Confederacy is that it lasts as long as it does. That way the whole South gets blown to pieces. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because if, mean, if they lost Bull Run or if they fell apart in 1862, uh, you, you wouldn't see anywhere near the devastation in the Deep South. Yeah, I, you know the war hadn't turned hard either. I guess one can make the argument that well, by the war going on, slavery ended. But I'm of the I'm of the opinion slavery was probably going to go away anyway because it's kind of going away throughout the whole Western world, and especially if they yeah. lost that war. Uh, I think I think it would have unraveled. Now, how it would have ended, I can't say exactly, but I don't. I think it wouldn't have been long for this world if they had lost even before an Emancipation Proclamation is uh, launched. You know. But anyways, so um, yeah. So to the to the detriment of the Confederacy, they will not be able to have a commander who can match Robert E. Lee, and the only one who's possible for it, Jefferson Davis hates his guts. So so Claiborne is stuck. With Bragg as his overall commander. But at least Bragg doesn't hate him. I mean, Bragg yeah. probably doesn't like him personally, but doesn't hate him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is be better than nothing, all things considered. And at this time, at least he has Hardy <laughs> over him for now. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, oh, okay. So, uh, after Murfreesboro, Bragg, Bragg withdraws the army to war trace. And it's here that uh, Cleveland's division uh, camps for the remainder of the winter and early spring. Uh, it's uh, in May that uh, dur during the whole uh, Vicksburg scare that Bragg starts uh, detaching troops, uh, particularly from Breckenridge's division and uh, Cowan's old division, down to uh, reinforce Johnston. Uh, and because of this, uh, he forms a new division under A.P. Stewart, and thus uh, Bushrod Johnston's transfer to this. Uh, it's because of this that... Uh, uh, a new brigade is added to the division. Uh, the, the, this is a unit of Texans who had fought at uh, the Battle of Arkansas Post under uh, Thomas J. Churchill, which uh, was sort of a kind of sad affair for the ferrets there. Uh, some 3,400 uh, Confederate soldiers surrendered there, and, by, and uh, only about 1,700 uh, reached uh, the Army of Tennessee, due to uh, just desertions and illnesses and death and such. Uh, 
Uh, Cleburne takes them in despite the fact that most of the rest of the army kind of, kind of hates these guys because, you know, they surrendered uh, under very dubious circumstances and uh, are considered cowards. And uh, you read accounts by guys like Sam Foster, uh, captain of the 24th Texas, uh, and this this sort of endears the unit to, to them, and they'll eventually become... Uh, They'll become strongly associated with him uh, uh, under uh, later brigade commanders uh, Hiram Granbury and uh, James Argyle Smith. And uh, But initially, they're under the command of uh, Thomas J. Churchill. Uh, during this time, uh, Cleburne is able to start uh, drilling his, uh, his division under his, uh, his current rule book. Uh, he starts emphasizing uh, sharpshooting. In, in his uh, units, starts forming up division-wide uh, sharpshooter units. Uh, he receives shipments of, I believe, about 20, was it, uh, Whitworth rifles? I forget the exact amount, but uh, he has, in order to dole these out to the best riflemen possible, he sets up, uh, he sets up for his division a uh, monthly uh, sharpshooting contest. Uh, for uh, all, all men in the division, in, in order to determine t the uh, best shots in the unit, in uh, the army, well, in his command, to uh, give these rifles to and assign to his sharpshooter company. Uh, this this also has the effect of improving morale because you know it's something to add to the camp life. And uh, uh, let's see what what else. You know, you also uh, uh, if, no no that's not right. Uh, he also implements a uh, British uh, rifle drill for uh, from 1853, I believe, uh, based around the uses of the uh, the Enfield rifle. Though most of his army was not, most of his command wasn't equipped with this. Uh, a lot of them were mixes of uh, Mississippi rifles and Lorenzes. Uh, but that, but uh, this training eventually. Uh, Made them some of the best uh, defensive infantry in the West uh, because their initial volleys, at least, uh, would be devastating enough to halt attacks outright uh, at times. Uh, let me see here. Anyways, uh, with uh, the passage of uh, the winter and spring, uh, Rosecrans finally makes his moves in late June of 1863 and begins the Tullahoma campaign. Uh, Cleveland's division is assigned to defend Liberty Gap, which they are pushed out of. He starts to prepare for a counterattack, but uh, news arrives about uh, the debacle at uh, Hoover's Gap, where uh, bait fucks up massively. Uh, that's a whole story on its own. Uh, certainly uh, the nadir of uh, A.P. Stewart's career. Uh, this forces Bragg to withdraw as uh, as it seems that his cavalry under Joseph Wheeler and, to an extent, Forrest had uh, failed him in uh, providing proper information on the enemy's movements because the, the Union cavalry was just straight-up outperforming uh, the Confederates and were beating them in combat at uh, places like Shelbyville. He's forced to withdraw to Tullahoma, uh, prepares for a, def a defensive fight that he doesn't want to do, but the rain comes in and slows Rosecrans in advance, which allows Bragg to withdraw to, uh, around Chattanooga. It's a very sad affair for uh, the Confederate force, uh, as they basically lost all of uh, Middle Tennessee for basically nothing. Uh, no major battles being fought at all. They they just been outmaneuvered completely. It, I I generally think it's like one of the best Union victories of the war. Most certainly. Um, the Confederates are lucky too that it rained as much as it did. I mean, the campaign was fought yeah. in less than a week long rain. Yeah, I've read about um, especially in the because Rosecrans had a few divisions that were supposed to hook from the north, where the Confederates had almost nothing. And that's because I mean, the reason Confederates had few, so little cavalry is that one division got sent down to Mississippi with Johnston, you know, to do nothing. And then one yeah. division led by Morgan went on a pointless raid in Kentucky with 
And Bragg actually, before Morgan left, Bragg told him, if the Federals attack, you are to come back here and help us. Anyway, Morgan ignored him. Uh, Morgan's a very interesting guy. I mean, excellent, yeah. like, cavalry mm -hmm. regiment commander. Uh, one of the very best of the war, but beyond regiment, the, guy's, the guy has no brains. Um, anyway, so two of his divisions are gone. So he's, you know, he's, he's, his force, cavalry force has been reduced right at the moment where it shouldn't be. The Union goes around his flank, but then the rain just falls and falls for days. I've read an account of, of uh, horses and mules literally drowning in mud in some places. Um, and that delayed the Union forces enough. I think if the weather is high and dry, there's a fair, ch there's a pretty good chance Rosecrans probably cuts off Bragg. Um, so the, 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 the Army of the Cumberland, too, had spent months during the winter improving their cavalry, making sure they were well-armed and trained, uh, improving overall training in the Army. The Army had a lot of confidence in Rosecrans. They loved him. And so I know, I know the period, Rosecrans, it could be argued he probably maybe waited a few weeks too long. But the fact that he waited is how he was able to prepare his army to pull off what it does. Uh, there is almost a major battle at Tullahoma. It comes very close to happening. It, it doesn't because very soon Bragg figures out he's about to get outflanked. And Polk essentially says, we got to get out of here. And it's a, I, I actually written a little book about Tullahoma that I'm working on off and on. And I actually write, I'm like, this is one of the best pieces of advice Polk ever gave anybody. Was, we got to get the <laughs> hell out of here. <laughs> But no, no, I mean, like for once, Polk was totally right. He's like, he's like, Bragg was kind of like, oh, maybe we should fight. And Polk's like, no, we got to go now. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the army also had been depleted at just the worst moment. And I mean, Rosecrans strikes exactly when it's perfect. Um, and of course, he had allowed his cavalry to get that experience and build things up because Rosecrans had figured out that you, um, the Confederate cavalry is so good that if you ignore them, they're going to do to you what they did to Buell and other Union generals in 1862. Get behind your rear, devastate it, and then your advance shuts down. So, also put a lot of stuff into garrisons and blockhouses at this time as well. Yeah, he and, forms an entire reserve corps essentially to uh, oversee that, along with uh, yeah uh, some reserves to uh, fill in uh, at uh, Chattan Chattanooga. Eventually, those get, those guys... Uh, will move under uh, steam and to reinforce that uh, Chickamauga, but but that's in the future. Yeah. Oh wait, one last thing. We found him. The two, the, the other two cult figures of the Civil War. I feel so dumb. It's obvious. It's Rosecrans and George Thomas. Uh, I'd actually uh, say uh, George Rosecrans. Thomas, I, I, I'd agree with Thomas. I, I I think he's got gotten more credit. Like, he's gotten more, more credit. I still think he's obscure enough to where he's, uh, if he's not a cult figure, he's definitely got like a hardcore fan club, you know. And um, but yeah, Rosecrans definitely um, a bit of a cult figure. And uh, I have to say, I'm an initiate. I think Rosecrans is amazing. I think he's only, yeah. I think he just had one bad day. That was it. <laughs> oh, that was that. And he was a Democrat. Can't let, they can't let a Democrat win too many battles. He might become president. I, yeah. Uh, I will say I'm a bit slightly more critical of uh, Rosecrans. I, I think he's great on a strategic maneuver, and I, and I think uh, Tulaha was his best campaign because yeah. it didn't result in him getting into the, to a major battle. Uh, well, he won Stones River and Corinth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he did. The thing is, like, reading up on Stones River and Corinth uh, uh, and, and Chickamauga as well, he, he, had a, he had a strong issue with nerves, I feel. Uh, he, he was very uh, uh, high strung. I, I'm, I'm, I think is, is the word. He's, he's very uh, had a very nervous energy, and uh, it, off, it often uh, led to very poor decision making uh, in, in the heat, heat of the moment. But mm. which well, is we'll eventually what led to. Uh, I think something else led to that in Chickamauga. We'd have to debate that in some detail. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's something I don't want to like. 
bogged yeah, down into I do, going I know. first. I, I'll he, say this. I'll only say this. I do think he did have slight nerve problem. I think he had a nerve problem. I think it's been overstated. Yeah. You know, maybe the case. Uh, I, I Sherman, definitely need to read Sherman a better book problem. on, on uh, Stones River Actually, than. Uh, I think Sherman had more of a nerve problem in battle than and than Rosecrans. He does weird eh. erratic stuff in battle. Yeah, but anyways, um, so uh, they've been outmaneuvered. Claiborne was uh, engaged at Liberty Gap, which not his best moment, but he does better there than. He does better there than Bate does over at Hoover. Oh yeah, yeah that that whole thing is is honestly hilarious, mostly because because it's fun watching Bate, Bate just take it. <laughs> Another one of his relatives dies there, by the way, too. Um, yeah, yeah. He writes about his report. He's like he was a good Christian boy and a a great family member. So there you go. Another member of the Bate clan dies because they're uh, following around this idiot. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I didn't anyways. know about the legendary bait until tonight. Oh boy, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, we'll, we'll get into him uh, more when we uh, uh, 1864 because that's where you know the really stupid shit happens, and, and, and also the asshole shit too, too because because you know uh, you, you because God wants us to be entertained by this man. And his and his failures. You, you need, you need catharsis in this. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, uh, during this time, uh, uh, Hardy is recalled and uh, transferred to Mississippi I, uh, in order to command the uh, troops under uh, Joe Johnson directly. Uh, this is kind of a very stupid move, but uh, as he's Probably the best of the corps commanders in the Army of Tennessee, you know, of the two they have. That said, he is not great, but you know, he he isn't the worst. Uh, he uh, Cleburne briefly commands the corps during this time. Doesn't do much other than uh, give out marching orders uh, to continue the retreat to uh, Chattanooga. Uh, eventually, uh, D. H. Hill from uh, Lee's army. Uh, arrives to take command. Part he's assigned there because Lee wants to get rid of him be- because he's a bit of a negative Nancy, I guess is the word, according to uh, Powell. And uh, but but uh, he's high rank enough that uh, David still thinks that he's worthwhile in command. So he's assigned to command the corps. Uh, though uh, Bragg apparently tells him when he first takes command to. Uh, Listen to uh, Cleveland's advice, as uh, he knows he knows a lot more about the man than uh, he he ever would. Uh, any anyways, uh, uh, er, late August, early September, uh, Rosecrans maneuvers and outflanks Bragg at uh, Chattanooga. Basically, takes uh, uh, Sand Mountain. And the pass is there without uh, notice because Wheeler fucked up and uh, had all his cavalry in the rear rather than patrolling along uh, the river. Uh, and so Bragg has to withdraw from Chattanooga without a fight, which I, I'd, I'd say is basically the moment that the Confederates lost the Chickamauga campaign. Because now the Union have a uh, have uh, fortifications in Chattanooga to, uh, to defend and place a garrison. Anyways, uh, Bragg, he's starting to get reinforcements from uh, Johnston and from uh, General Lee's army under uh, Longstreet. And uh, he starts forming a multitude of corps and uh, divisions and such from scratch. Uh, it's, It's one of Bragg's stupider moments where he He's constantly like reorganizing his army on the spot, which requires a lot more like staff to get promoted up and assigned and organized and uh, headquarters and such. Uh, uh, this all leads into uh, the Battle of Chickamauga. But uh, first, there was the incident at what was it? Doug Gap was it? Uh, I, f- I think there was another Macklemore's Cove. Doug Doug's Gap. Which yeah. one was it? Uh, uh, Mike Morris Cove, I believe. 
Yeah. Uh, they're a Union division under General James Negley with uh, some uh, troops under uh, General uh, Absalon Baird. Marched into Dose Gap, uh, isolated from the rest of the army uh, due to the narrowness of, uh, of the passage. Bragg's, Bragg finds out about this and uh, prepares uh, to destroy this uh, force in detail. Uh, he sends Cleaver's vision uh, through uh, one gap to the west, uh, to the east of uh, Negley's position, and he sends uh, Thomas Henman and uh, uh, Simon Bolbar Buckner's corps uh, uh, from the north in order to uh, uh, pin and uh, overrun uh, the small force with overwhelming force. However, he gives the onus of the attack to uh, General Thomas Hinman, who had just arrived to take command of Withers' division. Uh, Hinman, Hinman, this is probably his Nadir. He refuses to do the attack. Uh, I, I, I've seen a multitude of reasons. Apparently, he thought that uh, there were troops on his flank, or he, he just didn't get along with Bragg at all. Uh, but he doesn't go through with, uh, with the attack. Buckner arrives on the field, and he concurs with, with uh, Hinman uh, in, in his assessment. And because of this, uh, no attack goes through. Uh, Cle Cleaver was like, itching to uh, going to the attack, but DHL also uh, reined him in and kept him from uh, making an assault. Uh, and, and thus, uh, the opportunity was essentially lost, and this kind of soured uh, Bragg. Uh, going into uh, the rest of the campaign uh, on the ability of his commanders. And the, it, it's probably the most egregious example of just how bad the command situation in the army had gotten, that that's the army general, the army commander's orders are blatantly disregarded in such a flagrant manner. You have any thoughts on this, uh, Sean? I, I'm not sure how much you read on this this uh, part of the campaign. No, uh, I haven't read about Chickamauga in a long time, um, and it's honestly of all the major big battles Civil War, it's the one that interests me the least. It's just kind of just to me, just a giant slug match in the woods. Yeah, I it's, it's honestly the saddest battle of the entire war because it's 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 the second bloodiest battle in American history, and no one wins. It's it's entirely pointless. Be, yeah, because it's, yeah, it's the second one. Ooh, I thought yeah, it's, no, it's second I only right. to, second yeah. only to uh, Chickamauga. I think eighteen thousand total casualties. The Confederates lose about 18,000, Union 16,000. Yeah, yeah that, uh, right. that's right. I'm going to check right. something. If it's, if it's not second, it's definitely third. Uh, but I'm going to check something I got on on that real quick. But no, um, no it's I, I get why the people are into it because it's such a massive battle, so many big personalities there. Um, and you had some very dramatic moments and what-ifs to it. And, of course, there's George Thomas's great stand. But I, I know a lot more about Shiloh, Stones River, and Gettysburg. Than I do um, uh, Chickamauga, and in particular, I, the, the whole thing of the McLaurin, uh, McLaurin's Cove. I've I've heard arguments that the attack probably would not have worked, but I'd have to look into that in some detail. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, whole battle plan was very uh, unwieldy. Let's say the whole strategy that Bragg had in mind. Yeah, well, he's keeping together the organization that's very awkward. But that's also because he's getting reinforced with a lot of units from different quarters. And you, know, you mentioned, like, having Buckner. I mean, Buckner is another guy who's a military mediocrity. Um, his actions at Fort Donelson, from just a military like standpoint, are absolutely uh, abysmal. I mean, the soldiers at Fort Donelson are willing to keep fighting. And... Uh, the only reason they surrender is because Floyd and Pillow leave, because they got their reasons, and they leave him in command, and Buckner is just obsessed with, no, we got to surrender. Even though it's, you know, he just was completely demoralized. Um, so, not a very good commander. It does not do well at Chickamauga, either. Yeah, yeah, speaking of, you know, commanders not doing well at Chickamauga, let's 
getting back to Cleburne. <laughs> um, so Cleburne, uh, his commands marched up uh, on late on the 19th to reinforce right flank, which is commanded by, uh, well, it's currently being led in the field by uh, Liddell, who's in command of a, of a small division, I'd say. Small, even though it's about 3,000, 4,000 strong. Uh, he, uh, Cleburne goes into action and uh, launches a uh, uh, early night attack uh, against an exposed part of uh, Thomas's line that he was going to abandon anyway. And uh, with about 5,000 men, he manages to overrun, overrun uh, two regiments, uh, I believe the 7th, 77th Pennsylvania and the 29th Indiana. Uh and uh, pushed them back uh, a, a few yards back to the line that they were preparing to go to anyway. It, it, it's 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 kind of a bit of it was a bit of a mess of a of an attack, probably kind of a waste of time, all things considered. But uh, it, it's it's the high point of uh, Cleburne's actions at Chickamauga because the next day he's uh, due to the fuck up. Uh, regarding Polk and uh, D.H. Hill in terms of uh, getting orders across that night. Uh, Cleveland attacks late into the morning against uh, what is basically the center of the uh, of Thomas's line, which is now uh, entrenched and makes zero headway and only takes casualties. Uh, I, I need to pull up uh, Powell's book because he has a good appendix with a bunch of uh, strengths and casualties. Uh, I think Cleveland suffers around like a thousand casualties or so in his division uh, from this engagement. Uh, it, it it it's uh, it, it was a complete fuck up. Uh, 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 he he got angry with uh, one of his brigadiers, Sam Wood, who uh, whose brigade basically dissipated during the uh, combat and split in two for no good reason. Uh, meanwhile, James Deschler's uh, Texas Brigade, uh, they also got bogged down and suffered heavy casualties, and uh, Deschler himself was uh, killed. Yeah, I think, I, I was going to say, I think the problem with Wood was that Wood suffered um, serious head trauma at Shiloh. Like his, oh. he got knocked off his horse, and his horse dragged him around the battlefield for a few hours. Uh, so I detect in Wood because Wood did very well at Shiloh overall, but he seems to get worse as the war goes on. I think it was head trauma. Yeah, I mean that that may be another reason why he was uh, discharged. I always assumed it was just uh, uh, late uh, showing incompetence. It might have been. I mean. He does he does pretty well at Shiloh. I mean, his brigade gets a little disorganized here and there, but he's able to organize several very effective attacks there, and he stays in the field the whole time. And also, Wood plays a major role in, in carrying out the orders for the retreat at Shiloh. Uh, so he was very well thought of, but as the war goes on, he just gets worse and worse. And I, I, I always wondered that, and I think that's the reason. I think it was that damn horse dragging him around for a few hours. I mean, yeah. how's that sound? Getting dragged around for a few hours. <laughs> oh yeah, it kind of reminded me of uh, Basil the First. Uh, he got dragged yeah. around by a stag for a couple miles, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, he got, yeah, got heavily yeah. injured and then killed the first guy who came to like help him because he thought thought he was was an assassin or some shit. Right. Yeah, that was uh, how he met his end. A hunting oh. accident. Yeah, which which you always put in quotes because you know it's never never really a hunting accident. Unless you're really shitty at hunting, I mean that's possible. Yeah. Honestly, reading up about that, I I I I wonder how how the hell you fuck that up. <laughs> how, how how that could be an assassination plot right there. Don't know. I mean, I guess maybe it was a botch job, and then they had to come up with a story to explain the wounds on the Emperor. And then they're, oh, well, he was dragged for a long time yeah. on his horse. Miles. Well, well, the thing was, you know, you know uh, with, with these 
uh, the assass the, the guy getting assassinated doesn't live for a couple days afterwards like uh, Basil did, didn't he? Like, like I, he uh, survived for 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 a good while. I think so. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I read about that, but uh, yeah, it took him a little while to die. If it was an assassination attempt, it was a pretty bad botch. Um, I think it, there's a possibility that I mean, because Basil was such a you know, a guy who'd been a former wrestler and everything else, I think it's possible that maybe he was trying to overexert as an older guy and not be realistic about what he could do and then yeah. got himself into some shit he couldn't handle. Yeah, plus he was, like, born a peasant and uh, kind of murdered his way into uh, the throne. So uh, he had a lot to prove in terms of uh, his, you know, abilities, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Anyways, back to the room. I will say, Chick Maga is kind of, in in this case is kind of kind of the odd duck in terms of Cleveland's career. I, I wouldn't say his his personal handling of this was poor because his orders were kind of terrible. Because E. H. Hill and Polk are two two of uh, the. I, I don't have a high opinion of either, and especially in this incident, this is kind of the the deer of Confederate generalship, but. Uh, oddly enough, this is probably uh, Stewart's best battle and Bates' best battle as well, uh, because on the nineteenth, uh, Stewart and Bates they launch a uh, nearly successful breakthrough uh, in the center of the line, almost bisecting it in two. Uh, but uh, of course, it's kind of unsupported, and uh, Rosecrans is able to seal the breach. Uh, Though, of course, this eventually uh, leads to uh, Longstreet's success on the next day. Uh, after this, uh, Cleveland's division, uh, it's reunited. I didn't mention that uh, Liddell's brigade had been attached to uh, Liddell's new provisional division. So he, had, he was only going in with three brigades, but now it's back uh, af afterwards to four. Uh, though, though by this point, uh, the division had been... Uh, reduced about 4,200 men due to the casualties in battle. I, I believe Liddell's brigade suffered like the heaviest uh, uh, percentage casualties of any Confederate unit in uh, the battle. I, I may be wrong about that, but uh, I may be thinking of the division on a whole. And anyways, uh, go going into the uh, siege of Chattanooga. Uh, Cleveland's uh, in the reserve. He's assigned, I believe, at this time to Breck to either Breckenridge Division or I think it's Hardy's uh, Corps, be because Hardy by this point is returned due to uh, Polk uh, and other generals just uh, launching another petition against Hardy, and this time uh, with consequences, uh, them getting removed. Uh, Buckner gets sent to Mobile and uh, Polk to uh, Mississippi. Uh, he, he remains on the reserve line, uh, reorganizes his command, replaces commanders. Uh, in particular, uh, Mark P. Lowry takes command of uh, Sam Wood's brigade. Uh, uh, Lowry is kind of interesting. Uh, he he was a uh, Baptist minister before the war. Uh and was colonel of the 32nd Mississippi. Uh, so, uh, solid brig brigade and regiment commander. Uh, uh, he, he was kind of known as the uh, preacher general, and uh, he would often hold uh, the division's uh, religious ceremonies. Uh, like whenever they, it, they'd they have a f like, uh, national uh, fasting day that uh, uh, was ordered by Davis or... Uh, or a Cobb during the Atlanta campaign. Uh, he will be the one leading that uh, initiative, give, giving uh, sermons and such. Uh, but also you get uh, James Argyle Smith, who is one of the, who at this time is his only uh, remaining West Point uh, graduate in command of any of his units. Uh, Argyle Smith is a Tennessean, but he's given command of uh, the Texas Brigade uh, from Deschler. He's not that popular, I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go on a tangent about, about them because I've read up on uh, Lundberg's book about uh, the Texas Brigade here. Uh, 
But uh, Argyle Smith, uh, he will eventually command Cleburne's division after a certain event occurs, you all may know. Uh, and also during this time, uh, Liddell uh, eventually leaves the Army of the uh, Tennessee and uh, goes back to Louisiana, pro- most likely just to uh, protect his, uh, his home back there uh, because the Union were advancing further into the state. Uh, his command was going to be transferred to uh, Longstreet to assist in the siege of Knoxville because Bragg... Uh, I, I honestly have no idea why Bragg was just so adamant about denuding his, his army around Chattanooga. But uh, eventually, uh, posturing around Lookout Mountain forces uh, Bragg to suspend the, the transfer, and so Cleveland's aside to the far right flank of the Confederate Army at a place called Tunnel Hill along Missionary Ridge. It's here on the November the 25th that Cleburne uh, opposes Sherman's uh, apparently main as main attack on uh, the Confederate right flank. Uh, he does it pretty well, uh, though it requires him to be reinforced by brigades from other divisions like uh, Alfred Cummings' brigade from uh, Stevenson's division, recently exchanged from uh, Vicksburg. Uh, and this, in turn, uh, weakened the uh, Confederate line in the center when uh, Thomas made his uh, apparently diversionary attack in the center, which was what broke through the line, uh, especially around uh, Bates' front. I, I believe Bates lost about a third of his entire division. Uh, in that section. By, by the way, Bate, by this point, has been promoted to division command. The, yeah, uh, the, uh, that charge at Missionary Ridge is pretty damn incredible. Um, yeah, you know. yeah, it, it's 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 definitely uh, it's definitely the more crazy moments in, in the war, and probably Thomas's finest uh, finest hour, I'd say. Well, he, doesn't, more sort of he doesn't. Well, he doesn't order it, though. but it's it's really a way for. If you really think about it, it's a way for the Army of the Cumberland to to get revenge for Chickamauga. And, you know, think about within terms of the rivalry between the two armies. So the common view in the Army of the Cumberland is we saved you at Shiloh. And so the Army of the Tennessee is like, ha-ha, now we're here, you know, we're going to save you, right? And it's right. like, it's a way for the Army of the Cumberland to be like, no, no, we save ourselves. <laughs> um, yeah, meanwhile, uh, Sherman's dithering on, on the flank with his like oh, God, main attack, so bad. he's launching lone brigades piecemeal up up a hill. Yeah, yeah. I won't yeah, say it's like some brilliant defensive like operation on Cleveland's part because because it's so such a lackadaisical assault by Sherman in terms of just how like much pressure he was putting into it. Yeah, I mean, unless that's because Sherman didn't have much. I mean, Sherman by this time too is kind of figuring out. But some of their generals haven't quite figured out, which is you're launching a frontal assault in a fortified position, especially when uphill, you're not taking it. You know, without something extraordinary happening. And I'm saying that because Missionary Ridge works. Missionary Ridge works because the Confederate defenses are poorly sighted. The Army of Tennessee also didn't have experience in defensive warfare. Think about it. They attacked at Shiloh, they attacked at Perryville, they attacked at Stones River, they attacked Chickamauga. This is their first major defensive battle. So the lines are not properly yeah. laid out. They had all those men who had the rifle pits who ran uphill. The Confederates don't want to shoot through their own men. But also, there's absolutely no reserve. I mean, you know, no matter what, for a defensive line, unless you're truly strapped, I mean, you need to have a reserve even for a strong defensive line. I mean, that's just a, that's just yeah. a common thing, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, remember the Battle of New Orleans. I mean, Jackson didn't put Jackson didn't put every man up online. He knew he needed a reserve to be able to go wherever they would. And what do you know? That reserve went where the British main thrust was. So, you know, with no reserves and all the rest, um, that's why it occurs. And even then, it's not easy. I mean, the, some of those Union units do take some heavy losses, and none of those Union guys said, oh, yeah, it's a cakewalk, <laughs> you know. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty damn extraordinary. Um, the thing about Knoxville, though, I want to read about that again, but... I believe the reason is because Knoxville is considered strategically important. Yeah, because they're trying the railroad to... connection uh, from Chattanooga through Knoxville to uh, Virginia. 
Uh, I think there was a belief that there was wasn't much more they could do at Chattanooga at that moment. And Longstreet kind of wanted to do it also because he wants to be away from Bragg and he wants to get an independent command un- victory. Understandable. Yeah. So I, I'm not agreeing entirely with the move, but it's not as boneheaded as it's laid out. There are military yeah, yeah. reasons. Yeah, uh, I, I will say I don't think it's entirely boneheaded, but the, but the problem I, I have is that Bragg just sends so many troops to – to it, and and he and he and he's almost sending even more troops, like Cleburne's division. I, I think uh, uh, I think a couple more brigades to further reinforce that. He, he, even though it's just weakening his line, and it won't do anything to help Longstreet at the, that point due to supplies. Mm. Oh, should be noted one thing about Chattanooga. One of the other reasons it works out is because of Hooker. This is where Hooker regains his reputation. Oh, oh yeah, Look, yeah. Hooker win, wins uh, Lookout Mountain and uh, basically unsettles the uh, Confederate left and is able to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which since uh, since Halleck doesn't like Hooker, Grant doesn't like Hooker, so Grant gives him almost no credit afterwards. Yeah, you know, Grant, even though he, Grant he's, he's one of the reasons why the battle was won. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm currently reading like uh, Stephen Sears' uh, Chancellor's Phil, and I, I gotta say, Hooker may be, may be my personal favorite of uh, the Union generals. There may be another one mm-hmm. off the top of my head that I, that I've forgotten about, but I, 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 th- I think he, uh, I think he's gotten shit on too much. Yeah, uh, Sears' Chancellor's Phil book is good. He, he, you know, essentially at the end of the book, he makes the claim. He's just like, yeah, if Hooker didn't get wounded. At Chancellorsville, he wins the battle and is the greatest general ever. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about that, but he makes a good case. Yeah. He makes a good case. My problem with Sears, though, is that his take on McClellan is, um, I've got to be blind. Oh, yeah, overly time. negative. Like, yeah, like saying infinite. Sharpsburg was like some monumental achievement for Lee when it's one of his stupidest, like, pointless battles. Shouldn't have thought mm-hmm. that. that. That whole campaign was McClellan's greatest victory in Lee's First real def- like complete defeat, I'd say. Oh yeah, and you know, I, mean, I, th- I think doing a whole stream talking about Gallant McClellan's actually even worth it, just because of getting to the intricacies of why he fails and where his strengths and weaknesses are. But I remember reading both Sears and T. Harry Williams and watching the Ken Burns documentary, and I kept thinking something's wrong here. You're making this guy out to sound like he's a child. Like, there's something, like, mentally wrong with him. I don't understand how he got to anywhere that he's going. And also, I'd look at some of McClellan's decisions and be like, wait, that makes sense to me. And I gotta say, like, a guy like Rafuz is just buried Sears. So, I do like Sears a lot for anything involving not McClellan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I honestly agree re- reading this book. Um, yeah. All right, well... Uh, back to Cleburne. After this, his, his division, along with uh, I believe Stevenson's and Walker's, we'll get to shop out Walker Walker in a moment. But uh, uh, Cleburne's division is assigned to the rear guard since it's uh, in the best shape. It, uh, in the and uh, he is defending uh, Ringgold Gap, uh, which uh, behind it is the uh, Army of Tennessee supply train. Uh, Cleburne uh, is being pursued by uh, Hooker's Corps, which is uh, re- reinforced by a detachment from uh, from both the Army of the Cumberland and uh, Sh- and Sherman, uh, and it numbers about twelve thousand men, and compared to about four thousand under Cleburne. Uh, our Cleburne has uh, the advantage of high ground, and uh, he positions his troops well. Uh, he has a uh, regiment of uh, Arkansas boys on, uh, and uh, two two uh, Napoleon cannons hidden uh, right on the gap itself, uh, so so that when uh, Hooker's men uh, approach over the railroad cut, uh, they get slaughtered in close range and uh, repulsed. Uh, Attacks atta- occur along the uh, banks of uh, the ra- of uh, the mountain. Uh, uh, here, uh, Hiram Granberry, who's taking command of the Texas Brigade, uh, helps repel alongside uh, Laurie and uh, Polk, uh, Lucius Polk, 
uh, further attacks by uh, Hooker's men. Eventually, the supply train uh, gets out, out of harm's way, and Cleburne withdraws uh, as night falls. Uh, this is this is considered Cleburne's finest battle in some ways. At least it's argued that way. Um, he receives the thanks of Congress and is lauded by the Confederate newspapers. Uh, according to Irving Buck, there is a, a quote from Lee, which may or may not be apocryphal, where Lee referred to the campaign, and he referred to Cleburne as a meteor shining brightly over a clouded sky, which is super poetic, but I, I'm not entirely certain that Lee actually said that. And it's because of this that we get to probably the most uh, famous or infamous part of uh, Cleburne's life, which is the uh, Dalton Proposal. Uh, before we get on that, uh, any thoughts on the Ringgold Gap or uh, you know that Lee quote and such? Um, I probably probably didn't say that. That's not really the kind of language he used. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Lee, Lee's <clears throat> Lee could be um, sarcastic and humorous, and he could have a poetic turn of phrase, but not that kind of poetic, <laughs> from what I've read of his. Um, <clears throat> Lee may have actually heard about him and been impressed, but I think the thing about Ringgold Gap, I mean, we say slaughtered, but we're not exactly sure what the losses were, but they weren't, like, super-duper heavy. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't guard. heavy losses, per, per se, but, yeah. but uh, the attack was repulsed, and... Uh... Uh, and, and yeah, the wagon was, train. Was but you know, I yeah. think what Ringgold Gap really shows you is, you know, it's really going to be hard to pursue an army with infantry, especially when said infantry can take like can use the as a can use terrain to its advantage. Right, uh, especially in like, cases with Cleburne. If if you have a good defensive commander in uh, the train of North Georgia, and you're pursuing only with infantry. Uh, yeah, you're going to get your shit rocked. And that's probably like the first example that you get before the Atlanta campaign really starts. Yeah, and the Confederates really need good news at that moment. So, I mean, yes, Claiborne did well, uh, but this is not a genius stroke, and it's a Confederacy that desperately needs good news at that moment. That does not diminish Claiborne's achievement, it just means, it doesn't diminish it so far as it's a, it's a yeah. good battle, but this isn't a work of genius here. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be on the scale of, say, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Anything that's happening in, uh, anything that happened in the, the Valley Campaign under Stonewall Jackson, I, I don't think uh, Cleveland deserves the sobriquet uh, Stonewall the West. Uh, no, actually, or, I think the guy who deserves that is uh, Richard Taylor in Louisiana. Yeah, 100% and he does Taylor. that with uh, the Red River yeah. Campaign. Sure. Uh, not just that. I mean, I'm reading about, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of think now probably the best Confederate fighting cavalry is Thomas Gr Tom Green's cavalry in Louisiana. I mean, yeah. they in several battles take on Union infantry and just whip them bad. Um, you know, Bryce Crossroads style, only uh, without the advantage of a worn out enemy that's thirsty. Like, they'll attack them in their camp and whip them. Um, but anyway, it. That's a whole other story. Uh, there's nothing to say about this. Is um, if you compare Ringgold Gap to, say, Richmond, Kentucky, and I know you know Kentucky Rolling Plains and whatnot, but you know Richmond, Kentucky is one of the only battles of annihilation in the Civil War, and that's because the Confederates used their cavalry to cut off the Union force. Yeah. yeah. So, so well, Hooker going to go chase the go chase the Army of Tennessee with his infantry is. It's doomed on arrival outside of a miracle. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I, I doubt he would be able to get into the supply train, even even if he, like, routes Cleburne. Uh, but but that, that said, uh, even in Richmond's case, uh, well, I, I don't think that's, like, a complete, like, oh, this is on the level of, like, Lee at Chancellorsville, because that, that force, it was... Kind of large compared yeah. to Cleveland's, but the problem was it was very poorly trained. Most of it had just been recently recruited. And yeah. A lot of them had just been enrolled militia. And uh, they're also led by uh, they're also led by Bull Nelson. 
Oh yeah, who is a mixed bag certainly. Yeah, I mean, like, like there's some things he did well, but tactically he wasn't too good. Like at Shiloh, he actually just kind of plays with himself. Um, but I mean, but yeah, what's great about like, himself he's, by he's, shooting his own shooting fellow Union soldiers? Yeah, God. I mean, his march to Shiloh is great because he ignores because essentially Buell and Grant are telling him, "Oh, don't hurry up," and he goes, "Ask her," and I'm hurrying up. So that part is great about Nelson. But when he actually attacks at Shiloh on April seventh, uh, he doesn't really do much, uh, kind of just plays with himself. Um, you know, it's kind of a waste of a division. Uh, yeah, oddly enough, McCook outdoes him. That's how bad he does at Shiloh once the shooting starts. But um, I, I mention that because Nelson, like you said, shooting his own men. I have read so many accounts of Nelson just, like, hitting his own men, slapping them, insulting them. So this guy's not very inspiring. And... I only mention Richmond as an example of, like, it's not like a Chancellorsville thing, not not at all, but it is a battle of annihilation, which you don't really get in the Civil War very often. That's because they actually use the cavalry effectively for once. You know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's just, it's just one of those things, you know, that's why Civil War battles are not as decisive as Napoleonic ones. They don't have, like, Marat rocking his, um, his uh, 80s hair metal do. Yeah. <laughs> Also, as you point out, there's no real heavy cavalry uh, in the Civil War. You don't get cuirassiers or uh, dragoons or, <laughs> or the like. Uh, even though units are named that, you know, they're not really trained like that. Mostly just due to terrain and just expenses. But, uh, yeah. And lack of training terrain in general. Expenses. It takes a long time for cavalry to get ready. And then the cavalry themselves, there wasn't even any doctrine for charging really, which is in some ways kind of weird because there had been the American Revolution uh, with, like, yeah. Light Horse Harry Lee and the rest. There had been... American Cavalry had actually proven to be pretty effective on a charge and were yeah. used effectively. No, well, I, I'd, I I'd say, say the thing that, there is that uh, in, in the Revolutionary War, armies are a lot smaller and proportionally the, the cavalry units were a lot larger and uh, could, could do such things. Yeah. Also, you know, uh, a lot of the infantry weren't as well well armed as uh, they were in the Civil War in terms of, uh, you know, rifled firepower. Yeah, I'm part of that school that says the rifle's way overrated. They're really yeah. not. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do I'm, give I'm, credit for the first couple volleys, though, uh, because because that does help immensely, especially in Cleburne's well, case. Yeah, I, I, I feel there's a case for, for him, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I'll make that when I get to, like, Pickett's Mill. Well, yeah, that's what. Well, okay. If Claiborne's like training his men to use the rifle properly, certainly, and the rifle does have an effect on the battlefield because it makes it harder for officers to come up and for artillery to come up because if a guy does not use a rifle, he can get you. But most of the men just aren't being trained to use their rifles in that kind of way. They're being used trained to use them the way that you would have with a smoothbore. But the thing is, even in the Napoleonic Wars, if I see infantry and I charge with cavalry, the infantry are going to slaughter them nine times out of ten. You're not supposed to commit your cavalry until the enemy is in some kind of disarray. That's when you're supposed to charge. Or if you're really advanced, you can do like Napoleon Rivali, where you can combine infantry, artillery, and cavalry in one attack, so where the enemy can't choose the right formation to begin with. But I think in the Civil War, if there's one critique that I'd say is that even if your cavalry can't charge, they can get behind the enemy, which is what they did at Richmond. And a lot of times they don't do that. They'll just say, oh, go secure the flanks or something. Not a terrible use of horse, but, you know, the one time they say, screw that, screw supporting the flanks, why don't you just get around them? At the few times they do that, you do get some pretty uh, amazing victories. And we'll say, too, I want to get into... I want to read about this in detail, but, you know, with Sheridan and even Wilson, you start seeing the cavalry being used at the end of the war far more effectively. You start getting battles yeah. like Nashville, Five Forks. Um, the third Winchester. Uh, third, third Winchester, exactly. Ones where you're being like, oh, okay, now you guys actually are starting to fight in a way that is, is going to give you decisive results as opposed to just playing yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I I should note before before I continue with uh, the uh, Dalton stuff. Uh, uh, it seems that after 
1863 and all of uh, Cleveland's actions, uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, people, the higher-ups took notice of uh, how well his division did, at least according to Powell. And so uh, it seems they, they implemented a uh, rifle guide similar to what Cleveland was using uh, based on the old British uh, mm. manuals. Uh and implemented that for basically the entire army across the Confederacy. Uh, and, and so, o- overall, you know, uh, training wow. for uh, rifle usage had improved in the army, and similar, you know, uh, uh, sharpshooting uh, uh, competitions were held in units. Um, I also read this uh, in, what what was it? What was that? Decision in the West by Castell. Uh, he, he confirms stuff like this was also happening in, uh, in especially in uh, Manigault's division. Um, he focuses on uh, over in uh, Himmins' division. Uh, yeah, Manigault's one of the better brigade commanders they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manigault is uh, very outspoken, similar to uh, Liddell in some ways. Probably not as uh, well spoken, or but uh, he, he's quite opinionated from what I've read. Regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, stuff like uh, the Battle of Bald Hill, but uh, yeah, there's, there's also another thing that happens at this time too is armies are now becoming very proficient in entrenching, yeah. very proficient. <clears throat> so attacking is 1864. Attacking gets a hell of a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, going at well, the start of eighteen sixty four for Cleburne uh, is actually a bit more. Uh, it is probably uh, the most interesting uh, episode of the entire war. I find uh, in December, well, uh, early December, I believe uh, Bragg resigns. Hardy pr- temporarily takes command of the army before uh, Joe Johnson takes command. And I believe this twenty seventh of December. Is that correct? I don't remember the exact date. Yeah, I know. I know it's like near the end of uh, December. It's definitely before January, uh, because uh, the events okay. uh, I'm going to talk about will occur on the second of January. But uh, during December, oh wow, that's uh, wow. Yeah, we have Josh has his hands full. We have a right date and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like the first thing <laughs> on his plate when he arrives. Uh, and anyway, so in December, <laughs> Cleburne. Uh, we mentioned this before, but Cleburne, uh, he he had a he had a very interesting idea to solve uh, the Pharisees' manpower situation. Uh, in December, he started working on his uh, proposal, and uh, he started reading it to uh, his uh, subordinates uh, his, and his staff, uh, including Irving Buck and uh, Calhoun Benham, his uh, then chief of staff. We'll get to him uh, in a bit, but. Uh, uh, he basically was proposing that uh, in order to alleviate uh, A, alleviate uh, the Confederacy's man, uh, military manpower issues, uh, B, to garner uh, support abroad, and C, to diminish the uh, Union's uh, will to fight, that the Confederacy should uh, emancipate sl- uh, the slaves and start enrolling them into the army. Uh, this is... Uh, he, he has a few arguments uh, as, as to why this would work. Uh, some of them are crazy, like saying that um, uh, slaves fight, fighting in the uh, United States colored troops would start deserting and join their rightful uh, their rightful friends in the South, which, you know, wouldn't happen. Uh, but he, he does uh, point out that uh, one of the big reasons why they aren't getting for- support is the slave issue. Though, though it's not the... Though it's not going to 100% get the British on board with supporting them from from what I've been uh, told. Uh, it, it, it had been the big roadblock in them getting recognition. Uh, uh, in, in addition, he points out that a- abolitionism ha- has been a well, was a big rallying cry in the North, and if they take that platform away, uh, then maybe the abolitionists further in the North for the war would die down or get a bit into the argument, a bit too argumentative to 
uh, really put up a front against the Confederacy for uh, for the coming election. Uh, in regards to how they were would recruit slaves. Uh, he suggested that uh, the only way that they could guarantee uh, a slave would fight for the Confederacy would be to promise that his that uh, his wife, kids, and family would be recognized and given their freedom as well. That they can't just free one dude and say, "Okay, now you can join the army if you want." Uh, so, so in that regard, he 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 was a bit more pragmatic. Uh, Uh, in, in addition, uh, the thing the thing I read about regarding uh, regarding this is well, well, the most interesting part part I found is uh, it seems Cleburne at, on the one hand is writing this as more a pragmatic uh, proposal, but at the same time he also has some uh, very highbrow language in regards to uh, in regards to the slave at point points. Uh, talking about how they they dream of freedom as if they're actual living human beings, which I, I doubt is something that uh, the uh, subservient uh, narrative uh, accepts. That uh, the slaves that the the slaves are genuinely wanting to be enslaved, uh, but at the same time, he's also uh, implying that after the war, the Confederates could, of course, just implement laws to. Uh, prevent slaves from experiencing real freedoms on the same level as whites. Uh, it, it's hard to really grasp what his, whether or not he was like this secretly idealist or if he was just being pragmatic about this. I, I, I uh, you get more language well, of, the, the, of the, I'll, I'll let you talk, Sean. Well, I, no, just to say, I mean, that sentiment that we can free the slaves to fight for us, but we don't have to give them social, even political equality. Uh, you find it with anybody in the South who was discussing freeing slaves, or even um, or even after the war, like, say, uh, Beauregard or Longstreet, who would support uh, equal rights, would say similar things. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it's a pretty common sentiment in the North. I mean... Uh, several proposals right after the Civil War to extend the vote, voting rights to blacks in several northern states failed. Yeah, for instance. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been reading I'm, about uh, the, the northern, the, the Native Guard, and uh, how they were perceived by uh, uh, fellow Union soldiers and uh, uh, General Banks, who, who were fine with having black troops, but they weren't fine. They they weren't okay with having black officers. Uh, and so, and so they were eventually shuttled out, mostly or degraded. Yeah, and you know, there's there's a ton of reasons for that, but I think one of the big ones too is it has to do with the politics of Louisiana, which is one of the reasons why Lincoln sends banks to Louisiana in the first place is um, to set up the first Reconstruction government. So he so Lincoln assigns banks in large part because him and Banks literally agree on everything. It's like Lincoln. <laughs> cloned himself and made himself handsome. Uh, and I would actually say more charismatic in some ways, although Lincoln's got the better, like, uh, uh, maybe a little slightly better at politics, but whatever. So anyway. Yeah. Um, so he puts Banks in charge, and what Banks is trying to do is do the moderate position. So, you know, Banks uh, is part of that moderate position to mollify certain factions in his group is to weed out the handful of black officers who are in the Native Guards. Um, yeah. you know, at the same time, Banks was certainly no abolitionist. In fact, that's the reason why he doesn't get the Republican nomination in 1860 is because, you know, with the abolitionists being from New England, they knew him and they said, this guy is no abolitionist. Uh, so they were putting their support behind uh, Chase, was the guy they liked because he was he was the abolitionist of the uh, major Republicans searching for the nomination who was considered to have a shot. And anyway, so yeah, yeah, you, you, you know the the way black, the way that white soldiers can interact with black soldiers has in the North. There's a lot. There's a lot of comp. There's a lot of variation. I find, you know, but 
the idea, but but the, the, a Union soldier who would consider a black person their equal, um, I'd say probably less than five percent of the population of the North would be my guess based on the stuff I've read. I mean, they would yeah. consider one that they're full equal. I don't mean just like oh you can vote. I mean like full equality. I'd say less than five percent of them being generous. I even think most abolitionists are into that actually. When you get down to it, yeah, yeah, and then you get to the South where where that percentage is just George Washington Cable and possibly Sam Foster. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, when you said that, for my first thought was like, he's gonna say Cable, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's there's... like that's 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 effectively it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mentioned Sam F Foster before. Um, uh, he had no, nothing oh, yeah. to do with this uh, proposal at the time, and I'm not sure he really knew about about it at all because he was he was off uh, nursing a wound down uh, around Atlanta. Uh, uh, but uh, he, he has an entry in his uh, diary uh, on his way home after the surrender, and uh, he he's uh, talking about an encounter with this uh, black girl who uh, was just coming home from school. And he writes this uh, very uh, highbrow uh, entry about how you know in the future uh, black lawyer will have to go up, will uh, have to be going up against white lawyer, and, and the one who wins will have to be the bet will be the better one. As if you know, it's a, it's a very you know, it, it, it kind of sounds way too modern for for me to be certain that this guy actually wrote that shit because it seems. Because it seems like, oh, race is not going to matter in the future. But but this is 1865, written by a uh, Southern Texas Texan. And the thing is, like, he writes this, and in 1866, he gets to the House of Representatives in Texas, and he and he uh, votes against uh, voting rights for uh, uh, black men, uh, especially against the uh, 14th Amendment, uh, uh, pat ratific ratification of that in the states. So well, yeah, I mean I know we're we're doing our Odd tangent bunch. here, but it's 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 very pertinent to the discussion. Uh, not having not knowing Sam Foster really well, I, I have quoted him a few times, some choice quotations, like some good anti hood stuff. Which <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, he has lovely yeah. lines against hood. <laughs> uh, like like I mean, it, it's I mean, it's not eloquent; it's just to the point. Hood failed us. Yeah. He lied to us. Yeah, it, it's it's very. Um, I would say that there'd be two things I could think of. If on the one hand you could have like the Orval, Orval Fabus situation, where Orval Fabus, the governor of Arkansas, when they're doing desegregated schools, was uh, you know kind of a New Deal Democrat type. Um, he was considered in Arkansas to be soft on segregation, and so he became hard for segregation to save his political skin. That's what he did. It was a calculation. So yeah. that could have been it, you know. And yeah, that could, those kind of political, case. hey, those kind of political calculations. They also, I'm not saying they're great, but they happen all the time. I mean, think of how Obama evolved on gay marriage, right? I mean, yeah. what's right you know, on that poll? Fifty-one percent. Yeah, what an evolution. But the other one too is, um, I could also say that. Not, and I'm saying not knowing Sam Foster really well, it could be the opposite where what you said absolutely disgusts him. The idea that it'll be based on merit. Have not having yeah. read the quote. Um, if he's actually a hardcore racist, he could be like, this is absolutely disgusting. It should never come to this ever. I'm, but I've never read the it, quote. So that may be the subtext of it, but I, I am not entirely certain. I, I just don't know if I've ever read anything from this time period that ever sounded like this in, in terms of like the because it almost sounds like something from the 1960s in terms of like racial equality stuff, you know. You might get it from somebody like uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who uh, for a time led a uh, black infantry regiment in South Carolina. I want to say it was the first South Carolina that I forget which USCT they became. He would kind of write some stuff that would be sort of similar, but you know, I, I read his account. And it still has that, like, New England, like, I'm patting you on the head paternalism thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be the, the general, like, gist. It's, it's still, like, 
um, it's still mostly based on like paternalistic, like superior at- attitudes to uh, uh, to uh, black people, uh, rather than just uh, simply concern. Well, it, it is concern for like the barbar- barbarity of, of the practice and the you know, the uh, inhumanity of it all, but at the same time, you know. And it's just something I've noticed. I, I think I'm also get the I'm in this is my own opinion, but I think somebody like Higginson, like let's say like they'd free you know, you free the slaves and the slaves decide, you know what, we don't like this whole New England thing. Like we're gonna do our own thing. I think somebody like Higginson would be horrified. That's just my guess. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, Wait, I freed you so you become like us <laughs> Or maybe even thinks they can't. I don't know. Actually I haven't read that book in a while. Yeah, actually I'm not gonna pass judgment on Higginson, it's been a while. But I did get that yeah. feeling reading it of that that sort of vibe, you know. But yeah, we, so I read the Claiborne proposal uh, many years ago. Yeah, there are these things that feel, in some ways, rather confusing. I think what's one of the more interesting parts of it is him evoking the history of oh yeah, the that's, that's 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 the favorite service. part of mine. Yeah, the, the Helens and Lepanto and and uh, and, and uh, yeah yeah uh, Simon points to the fact that he called back to fucking Haiti. Uh, as as like a symbol of hey hey look the slaves will 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 fight uh, uh, to a uh, crowd of men who ha- have lived in fear of slave revolts their entire lives. And, oh yeah, and, and he's <laughs> quoting the the worst like the bloodiest slave revolt in human history up to this point. And then he's and, and, he's just thinking, come on man they won, <laughs> uh, you know but it's yeah, like yeah. Right. Yeah, but that, that that's that thing where you're like you don't have to read the room because you know the, the Haitian the Haitian Revolution, an argument can be made that that's one of the things that stops abolition happening in the South. You can you can right. see with Thomas Jefferson. He goes from talking about it to be like like, oh my god, if free the slaves, they'll kill us all. Yeah. It, it really it absolutely terrified them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do feel I do hear people go a bit too extreme with with that and say, oh, oh, they should have done that that because then uh, we wouldn't have the, have the civil war on their own. It's like, dude, dude, they they did they did not think down the line. Oh, hey, this is going to to ruin shit for everyone else in every other part part of the Americas. Yeah. We're, 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 we're the guys suffering that's right now. A, yeah, that's such a that's such a stupid stupid thing. Of course, I mean that would that would describe some kind of like mystical powers like they have a palantir or something actually palantir doesn't even show you the future to be clear you yeah know? yeah i think the word yeah. tele- teleology is is what what i've heard where you judge history by uh by how things things end and you kind, kind of like look backwards and you, you say oh they should have known this was where it's where it was going in it's like fuck no it was not well a teleological reading yeah, i think the better is, is where you uh usually based on ideology and then there's sort of a, a perception that societies have to go a certain direction and that there's an inevitability yeah. built in. Um, well, my professor taught me wrong yeah. then. But yeah, I, mean, I guess there, I guess it's kind <laughs> of the same idea in a way. The idea being that, uh, yeah, it is kind of, a I don't know if teleology is not the, quite the right word, but I think he was on the right track. Yeah. But I guess it's yeah, reading no, backwards um, from the results. I mean, I think you could, like, view a certain thing as being tragic, right? Um, and I'm not being an expert in the Haitian Revolution. I read books a while back about it. I mean, one could make an argument that going with Toussaint L'Overture was probably in some ways a big mistake. Um, yeah. You know, but what do they know at the time? They just know that he's an effective leader militarily, you know, which can say the same thing about Napoleon if you happen to be against Bonaparte, which, you know, or something like that. But, yeah, no, it's um, it's, it's, it's a very frustrating thing. And yeah, anytime I hear that, I'm also like, yeah, yeah, like, like Nat Turner knew it was going to actually happen. Also, Nat Turner's a religious fanatic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, that, that, that whole revolt. Uh, that, that may be the most, like, fascinating like moment of uh, Thomas's like pre war life, the fact that he was living in the same county where that shit was going down and nearly got killed. And he still joined yes, the union. Yes. 
Well, he definitely he definitely was an abolitionist. Uh, his wife owned some slaves. He had, I mean, he had shown no inclinations towards abolitionism at all. Uh, during the war, the Army of the Cumberland, I'd say in its handling of slavery, is overall the most conservative of the Union armies. Uh, overall, maybe also the Army yeah. of the Potomac. Yeah, in the, well, the Army of the Potomac, they're going to use a lot of black soldiers. Actually, more black soldiers in the active service in the Army of the Potomac than any other one. But, you know, it should also be noted, though, that Thomas does seem to have overall softened about it over time. Uh, yeah, I wonder especially about at Finn. Nashville, by that point, he uh, utilizes them eh, in, to mix results at Nashville, per se. Yeah, yeah, that you have to get into the whole tactical details in Nashville at that point, you know. Um, yeah. The USCT didn't do so well on the first day, but it was a pretty dumb attack on the first day. But, no, it just um, – yeah, no, no, that's what I'll say. Uh, Thomas was wary about sending black soldiers in at Nashville. He was impressed by them, by what they did on the second day. One of the regiments in particular lost, like, almost half its number. I've actually read Confederate accounts for Confederates. who are like, wow, those guys are really showed some grit there. Uh, which I think is the big thing with, with Claiborne as well, is that in his proposal he's saying that, yes, slaves have fought great in the past, and they've already proven themselves in this war. Which, you know, a lot of those officers don't think that. And also, keeping in mind, too, the Army of Tennessee has not fought any black soldiers up to this point. Black soldiers have only fought in the peripheries. Port Hudson, Milken's Bend, Battery Wagner... But Claiborne's looked at those reports and has, has himself decided that the USCT have already proven themselves. Yeah. Which is a lot uh, higher praise than, you know, most other uh, historians of until recently would uh, give them, but, or even any of his uh, contemporaries would. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms there. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I, I'd say... USCT overall is a very poor performance record. That's mostly just due to poor like handling of them by uh, their officers, many of whom just are either ideological idiots or uh, just uh, don't give a shit about any of the troops on their cannon and only want the uh, want the rank. Yeah, you have some who would treat their uh, guys like slaves. I've actually been reading about. Uh, a group of USCT who actually had almost a full, almost a practical full-scale mutiny because their commanding officer was beating them and torturing them. I mean, real torture, like yeah. you know, like um, uh, pouring like I think molasses on them in summertime, and like pinning them down, spread eagle on the ground naked in the sun for like a day, like just some heinous shit, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, I mean, I think the problem with USCT also is that by the time they're active in the war. The Union's on the attack all the time, and the attack tactics aren't that good. And you got soldiers who have... Who are, I, I, you're right, they're, they're, getting, they're getting better with their rifled muskets, but more importantly, they've got entrenchments. You know, so yeah. most attacks are failing with decent troops, let alone men who haven't even been in a battle yet, and in some cases have crap officers. Uh, I think one of the problems you run into the USCT is just... Because of the racial politics of it, even then, it gets hard to evaluate them fairly. And also, a lot of times, they're in like a horrible situation, like Milken's Bend. Uh, you know, some of those soldiers at Milken's Bend hadn't gone through a musket drill yet. Some of them had only been, had, were escaped slaves who had only been in uniform for like a few days. What can you expect out of them? Of course, the Confederates beat them back to the river and inflicted horrific losses on them, but... The thing to know about Milken's Bend is the one regiment of USCT that's there. Well, they weren't called USCT at the time, but the one red, black regiment's there that is trained, that had a decent colonel, and had done some, like, skirmishing and patrols, they fought really well and actually took the heaviest losses because they stood and fought while the guys who were, you know, fresh out of slavery, who don't know how to, you know, handle a musket, fled. You'd run too, wouldn't you? Especially a bunch of screaming Texans are coming at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and th and that's like the other thing. I uh, I, I got that uh, Nashville book you recommended me like way way back, uh, and, I, and I was kind of shocked to read, uh, uh, especially from uh, in, in regards to the uh, incident at Brambury's Lunette, uh, the uh, the uh, insults uh, hurled at uh, the USCT by uh, 
Cleveland's old uh, old troops. Th- th- though I say that in yeah. Vampire's Brigade, we're generally vicious against black troops because actually, I think we'll get back to that uh, later on because that's a story of its own. But okay. uh, but but yeah, the, the the first instance that they go up against uh, that uh, they they encounter black troops is at uh, uh, Dalton in September or October when. Uh, uh, Hood's uh, doing his maneuvers against uh, Sherman's supply lines to kick him out of Atlanta, and uh, yeah. they they all they are on the verge of murdering all the uh, all the uh, black troops inside. Uh, they they are prevented from doing that, but uh, they do steal all their shit and uh, and uh, abuse a couple of them. Some some of them probably got murdered, but most of the garrison survived yeah. just to go into slavery. It's a sad affair, that yeah. one. Uh, interesting aside on that one. Uh, after that happened, Beauregard inspected the army. And um, he asked Hood a bunch of pointed questions. And one of them was, did your soldiers mistreat the Dalton garrison? And I bring that up because when Beauregard had prisoners from the 54th Massachusetts, he gave explicit orders that they were to get equal rations medical care and they were in no way to be abused and when the governor of South Carolina said well some of them they should be hanged or some of them return to slavery he actually said no in all cases now that's not entirely a humanitarian thing you know but I think besides the fact that Beauregard has softer views on race than the average Confederate general he also understood before the other ones did that, hey, if you abuse black soldiers, they may stop exchanging prisoners with us, you know. Which is what they do. Or, they, or like, or, or even worse in his mind, they may start abusing our own prisoners. So we should just, they're soldiers, treat them like soldiers, that way we avoid this kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah the but, whole prisoner system in the war deserves its own rant, but I, but I think we've even gone yeah. far enough with the tangent already. Anyways, he shows this to most of his subordinates, and uh, uh, we and uh, apparently we get a couple of sides. Uh, a lot of his uh, subordinates were doubtful about it, uh, uh, asking asking questions about uh, the practicality of it of, of it at all, and if, if he's really willing to go through with this, even though he could basically end his career. And he gave comments that he'd prefer to command a black brigade uh, rather than stay in command end, end of a division. Uh, if, if it meant to uh, do good for the Confederacy, uh, the the one person who was not swayed from uh, by any of this was the his chief of staff, Calvin Benham, uh, who uh, I think was from Atlanta. Uh, that that's a thing. Oh, most of uh, the hardcore fire readers seem to uh, come from like Georgia and uh, and uh, South Carolina, uh, and. Uh, you know, like Howell Cobb, uh, Robert uh, Toombs, uh, and we'll, we'll see in a moment, uh, Shot Patrick Josh Walker. Uh, anyway, anyways, Calhoun, mm-hmm. um, he, he asked for a copy uh, to uh, prepare his own rebuttal uh, when the meeting comes, and Cleveland obliges him. And this, is, this copy is the only one to have survived to the modern day, and this is the one that uh, uh, we have available to us in, in the public. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, it was ordered by Davis after he found out about this that all copies be destroyed. But for some reason, Calhoun kept this uh, in his possession secretly, and apparently, it was found in his possessions after he died. Uh, and it uh, was published in the uh, official records, uh, so it's available there, and it's also available on uh, battlefields.org, the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, I, I posted a link on the server if uh, y- if any of y'all want to look, but uh, but yeah, January second comes along. Cle- uh, Cleveland's gone on a meeting with most of the high command of the army. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, the only uh, other person uh, who knew about the contents of his proposal at that meeting were Thomas Hyman, who was also. Who, who also had similar feelings towards uh, slavery uh, in terms of uh, practical military use for the Confederacy uh, and had been writing uh, letters anonymously in the Southern papers about such proposals, uh, though on the lower scale. 
and uh, and wait, uh, you've been writing. Uh, you've been writing letters about that. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, you've been writing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what was it? The uh, I think it was like the Nashville Register or something. Some relatively liberal paper in the South. That's uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Hinman. He he has a very. I, I am entirely certain that he did that more for political reasons than anything. Uh, as all things with with this nutbag. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's in, yeah, yeah. But that's that's what I read up in uh, Bruce Levin's uh, Confederate Emancipation book, which decent read, I, I'd say. Uh, about uh, the the actual uh, attempt to uh, emancipate slaves in the Confederacy uh, uh, in late in uh, 1865, early late 1864, and uh, why that all why that all failed and did basically nothing. But uh, but yeah, he goes to the meeting. Uh, he starts presenting his paper. Uh, and apparently we're using it almost verbatim, uh, going through the whole thing uh, with pa with uh, pauses. Uh, apparently he was not the best speaker, as as we mentioned before. But uh, he has experience as a lawyer and a some speaker, so he, he does a decent job. Eventually he finishes and passes off the baton to uh, Hinman, who gives some support, uh, supportive words before passing off the baton to uh, uh, Benham, who uh, makes some. Well, we don't know the exact details of the critiques uh, beyond uh, that. Uh, it wouldn't be practical, uh, and of, and of course, that uh, the only other note is that he, he kept his uh, criticisms uh, mild uh, because he was a subordinate of uh, Cleburne, and uh, that that was what you were supposed to do as a uh, subordinate: keep uh, the language respectful. Uh, and after that, that's when all hell broke loose because. Uh, James Batten Anderson, uh, William Bate, and uh, Chop House Walker started uh, uh, making accusations about uh, Cleburne and his loyalties and whether or not he should be uh, considered a traitor for uh, his sentiments. Eventually, Joe Johnson decides to end the meeting there and order all, all everyone involved to just shut the fuck up about uh, this whole ordeal. However, Chop House Walker, uh, he decides... I should probably call him William H. T. Walker because that's his actual name, even though Shop Pouch is way better. But uh, he, he ignores this, goes to Cleburne, and asks for a copy of this to send to uh, Davis uh, in order to out him. Uh, Cleburne agrees with this apparently because because he thinks that if it goes to Davis, Davis will uh, will uh, be open to uh, the conversation and uh, and that it would be overall beneficial to Pharisee if he, if he read it. And so, so he uh, gives off off a copy to Walker. Walker then goes around to to find as many uh, of the uh, generals present at that meeting and see if see what or their their stance on uh, the issue was. Uh, we find out that uh, Carter Stevenson uh, was supportive of slaves being laborers for the army, but not soldiers. Uh, Stewart, uh, this is where we find out about Stewart's uh, more conservative attitudes towards uh, the issue. Uh, you know, kind of softly agreeing with uh, Walker, though not as harshly, that uh, slaves wouldn't make good soldiers and that slavery is uh, part of the Confederacy's uh, DNA. Uh, Th it's Thomas Hinman brushes... Uh, he I, I, I forgot the exact quote. Yeah, St Carter L. Stevenson. Uh, he, he was also division commander. Uh, um, yeah, no shot there. He's probably their most... He's probably their... Maybe their most incompetent division commander. Oh yeah, by and far, he is the the wettest sandwich of them all. Yeah, yeah. He, his his division is uh, notorious for its level of desertion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 abysmal. Uh, and, and there's no there's no point in the Atlanta campaign that it does well, nor in the uh, Chattanooga campaign. Well. Well, I'd say Cummings Brigade, but that's because it fought under Cleburne, and you know, a day under Cleburne that that'll be the high point of anyone's career. Uh, but yeah, uh, Cummings is but, also uh, Cummings is also a pretty uh, Cummings was a decent commander, though he had he had fought in uh, he had fought under Lee, and he had he had won his promotion fair and square. 
you know, like oh yeah, definitely. Commander. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because uh, the guy got a got a uh, city uh, in in uh, the county I used to live in, and and, and, so, and so I always had uh, this uh, local newspaper who were called What's in Coming, and uh, <laughs> yeah, the name. Yeah, and me as a uh, child that did not know about Civil War stuff and not knowing uh, who this man was, that that gave me a couple of chuckles as a ch- <laughs> growing up, and still yeah. does today. <laughs> did you use the phrase hey, wet no, no, there was that... earlier? Yes, in yeah. regards to uh, Stevenson. I've Stevenson. never heard that yeah. before. Coming, uh, there's actually a guy from, uh, there was actually a guy on the tour today from uh, Cumming, Georgia. Oh. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> ask him what he was named after. I just kind of guessed when I heard Cumming. I was like, oh, that's probably Alfred. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, Alfred was a minor politician back in the day. Though though it may have been like another guy named Cumming because there's a couple guy, guys with duplicate names. Like there's a Hampton County in, in Georgia, but it's not named for the Hamptons of uh, South Carolina. Hmm. But, uh, gotcha. but yeah, continuing on. Uh, Hinman was also asked, but of course he uh, was a bit of he was quite abrasive with Walker and said, told him that he would have. I I don't have the quote on me, but he said something along the lines of, uh, "I will not take part in your farce." Uh, so Wait, so eventually, uh, he, uh, Thomas Hindman, the the uh, the Arkansas politician guy who. Uh, Wait, he told who he told who Shop was a Pouch Walker who, who Shop Pouch Walker who was trying to basically like basically cancel Cleburne essentially. By, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Ima- imagine going to uh, the guy's best friend and asking him to to make a quote that that would damn both you and and your friend. Walker's not very bright. Yeah. No. He, he, he I, I think he's a better division commander than he's given credit for. Uh, Bald Hill is, he, he does well until he's dead there. Uh, he, but uh, you know, aside from that, he doesn't have really high marks from me. Uh, yeah, he's also yeah, no, no, he's, he's played no, he's an a, asshole he's a as well. Division. Oh, definitely. I just, uh, him and Stewart are, uh, are are decent division commanders. I just meant that they're not. In the case of Walker, he's not like you know. A, I'm not exactly going into him for intellectual debate or um, curiosity, you know. Yeah, or interesting, or interesting uh, tactical innovations or such. At yeah, least he isn't yeah. bait. But at least he isn't bait. <laughs> oh, about the Dalton <laughs> incident. Bait, bait was also one of, one of the uh, the guys on the scene who was saying, "Yeah, let's fucking kill them all." <laughs> uh, 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 oh I'm, God, I'm Dolphin Garrison. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's that kind of asshole. Did, I didn't know. I, oh God, I didn't even know he was in the Nashville book you were He he is. Oh. It that is why it's so fun to read up about all the time that this this man takes the L. <laughs> though, though at the same time, you know that that L is at the expense of uh, the the innocent soldiers under his fucking command. <laughs> yeah, goddamn. Oh my God! This is this is the worst guy ever. The only story I like about him is the cigar story. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Yeah. On, yeah. Honestly, I have higher regard for Shot Pouch Walker than than I than I do Bait. Like, despite the fact that Shot Pouch Walker is just yeah. just a pile of shit that try that try to ruin it that try to ruin the best like commander in the West's career. Over, over uh, this proposal, yeah, I, I, I still think more more of him than, than fucking bait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if Walker ever like called for straight up war crimes. <laughs> yeah, well, eventually that letter two weeks later ended up in uh, Davis's hands. He he read it and uh, immediately discarded it. Uh, had 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 it destroyed and ordered uh, that. All talk on the subject in the Army of Tennessee was to be uh, shut, no, and that all all copies of the order would be destroyed. Which is why, you know, Benham's is the only one to survive somehow. Mm. Uh, yeah. After this point, Cleburne doesn't really make any comments about about it. Obviously, because he's not allowed to. Uh, 
But, yeah, uh, a lot of people say this is the point where his career would forever be stunted. Uh, people point to uh, the quote by uh, uh, Bragg uh, regarding this and saying, we must mark these men, uh, implying that uh, he was working to prevent Cleburne's promotion from this point forward. Uh, but I, I, I have heard otherwise that uh, considering Davis would eventually... Uh, pick up the argument in October of that year, and kind of argue the same thing, though on a you know lighter, uh, more watered down variant. I don't think Davis, on a personal level, level disagreed with it. He just think, thought it was politically inconvenient. Uh, yeah, he thought it probably was politically um, impossible to pull off. Uh, the I didn't know about Heinemann. I have found evidence that Beauregard had brought it up in 1863, but more of like something in conversation or like a huh you know this might be an idea but nothing like a yeah. formal proposal yeah and also same uh, deal with like richard mule apparently after bull run he said similar shit to uh to uh uh davis about it and got shot down and and he still had a career after that yeah no exactly oh, oh wait there's another one too uh the, the postmaster general of the confederacy uh, had brought it up in 18 oh yeah reagan yeah yeah, Regan. And Makes I mean, he, the only other guy Davis, the only other guy Davis trusts more in his cabinet is Benjamin. So, yeah, yeah. And Benjamin was one of Davis the guys uh, who who would go on to uh, push the emancipation the the uh, project later on uh, uh, when Davis finally got things rolling. You know, I continue with my thesis though. Almost everyone we've brought up is actually a fairly intelligent, well well read person. Just about everybody we've brought up. Except Bay. You know. Except for Bay. No, no, no. I meant like the ones who are going to entertain the idea or right. support it later on. I just, I call it a weird thing, right? But I'm like, you know, these tend to actually be the ones who are uh, uh, just, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're well read. They're just smarter for the most part. Or yeah. some like some like Stuart's smart, but Stuart's like a mathematician, you know? Uh, right. Where, yeah, so anyway, just. Just my own personal theory on it, just something I noticed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I honestly fully agree with that. Uh, uh, given all the evidence you provided, provided looking at all the uh, all the people that, that have been staunchly against it, mostly being the nitwits of the army. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the best one... I think the, comm I think the only commander who was... Adamantly opposed to it. Who are, the only two were decent were Stewart and Anderson. Uh, which yeah. Anderson? Uh, uh, Jim Patton. Yeah, yeah. Patton Anderson was a decent commander. Uh, apparently, when better better at brigade yeah. though than division. Yeah, certainly. To be fair, better. He was very good. He was an excellent brigade commander. Uh, yeah. Division. Uh, he's not terrible though. Yeah. Know, but anyway. Uh, you, you know. Uh, before we continue on, I, I am thinking back to 1965 uh, when Lee finally uh, uh, spoke out, out about the issue. Apparently, uh, Longstreet was against the idea of, of uh, black soldiers in the Confederate Army because he thought uh, the argument I heard from him, him was that uh, by that point in the war, uh, the whole po all it would do is give people an excuse to desert the army to recruit soldiers in, into the ranks. When in reality they were just going to go home and just avoid the war, as it finished up. So, so oddly enough, Longstreet, who most people consider the most liberal of uh, Lee's subordinates, uh, especially given his post-war career, was the most adamant against it. You know that I know we're going on about the Confederate emancipation thing here, but I'm not surprised with Longstreet because he gave a very practical reason. And yeah. Longstreet, Longstreet, more than most of the um, really high ranking, like you know, core and above level commanders, is very much in touch with his men. He's around them all the time. He's very practical, um, and he was very popular with his men. I think he'd been around them enough to know, like these guys would use this as an excuse to get the hell out of here. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. A guy like that, if he was going to be opposed to it, would give a practical reason, not a. You know, um, uh, you're, you're that's my way of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and on the other hand, you get to someone like uh, John Brown Gordon, who you know, the the most uh, 
probably one of the more conservative of uh, Lee's generals by that time. Uh, definitely, uh, he he was probably the most adamant of uh, Lee's subordinates, aside from Ewell, who you know was basically Richmond's garrison commander at that time. Uh, of his main commanders, he was the most uh, supportive of it. But I think that's mostly because his his corps was just so withered and weak that he he wanted to uh, uh, reinforce it in any way he possibly could. I can see that. It's also um, the other one worth uh, saying about that though is that he is um, Gordon is to me like Gordon is kind of like a snake. You know, yeah. Now I think about it. Yeah, that's right. He he is very very, uh, very politician about it. Very politician. He's a very effective commander, but uh, yeah, I consider him. Yeah, I consider him like he's not like really really slimy, but he gets close to it, and he he does some slimy shit after the war, smearing other officers. Yeah, uh, and throwing blame on them. And he made up he made up all sorts of stuff, like you know Lee predicted the enemy's movements at every turn. You know, just. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm not surprised. Gord- Gordon, I th- Gordon to me doesn't have many scruples about much of anything. Yeah, the, I will say I 100%, uh, I 100% believe uh, the stories about uh, him at, at Antietam just crawling away with five bullet wounds in, in him from uh, the sunken lane in the middle of the night. Oh, oh, def, I, I believe that too. But I mean, he was yeah. like, uh, he, I mean, he, 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 he was the most badass story of the war. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's fearless in battle, you know. So anyway, so we get Claiborne. Now we're in the Atlanta campaign, right? Um, yeah, and he's yeah, big I, fights, I actually what, before. Big yeah, I, I before oh. I want to before I go to the Atlanta campaign, I do want to mention uh, one aside. Uh, uh, during that time that uh, the letter was going to uh, Davis, uh, Hardy took Cleburne and some of other officers to. Uh, to, uh, I believe, Montgomery, or maybe all the way to Mobile, uh, because he was getting married to a to uh, a woman who was 20 years his junior. Uh, or so... I, I forgot how old she was, but I know that she was uh, born the, the same year that Hardy graduated West Point. Which, which was well before the war. Uh, 1838, I believe. So do the math there. I, I yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyways, during this, tr- it's during this trip that uh, Cleburne meets uh, uh, the biggest romantic uh, relationship he had in his life, uh, Sue Tarleton, uh, who, who I discovered a while back was was also uh, 12 years his junior. Uh, though you know that that's ca- kind of better than uh, what Hardy was freaking doing by barely anything. Uh, and, and anyways, it seems uh, it seems that uh, their, their relationship started off a bit rough because Cleburne isn't the most socially well, is very socially awkward in these types of situations. It seems, and uh, uh, he he didn't get anything solid from from her about relationship, but she she let him uh, write letters to her uh, on a regular basis. So, which, yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on uh, so uh, on uh, Southern society to to know what's uh, that's supposed to imply, but yeah, you know, uh, and so for the for the rest of his uh, for the rest of the year, he's writing uh, letters uh, in his off time to uh, to uh, her to uh, Sue Tarleton, who. Uh, uh, down in Mobile, and often requests uh, permission to uh, have leave to uh, visit her, but is always denied. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about, about this uh, going forward, but uh, uh, a- after the after his death, apparently Sue Tarleton uh, uh, became sort of a reclusive, depressive uh, figure and uh, died from a fall in 1868. Uh you know, one of those uh, famous Southern, you know, uh, stories of women woes. I may have gotten a lot of that shit mm, wrong, sad. though, but... But, uh, but yeah, going forward, uh, uh, Cleburne, uh, 
there, there was also an incident during uh, the, uh, what was it, the uh, Meridian campaign, I believe it was, when Sherman was raiding against Polk's force in uh, uh, Mississippi. Uh, Cleburne and, uh, I believe it was Cheatham's division, were transferred to uh, uh, to try to reinforce Polk to uh, do some action against Sherman. But uh, this was stopped when uh, uh, Thomas in Chattanooga made uh, maneuvers uh, against uh, Dalton, which uh, forced Cleburne to return and uh, retake positions. But this meant that uh, his men lost their winter quarters, uh, uh, which they had prepared back in January, you know, with log cabins and such. Uh, uh, in, in March, I forget the exact date, but after uh, he he was uh, after he gave an execution to uh, a deserting soldier, uh, snow had fallen, and his uh, command, who had, most of whom had never seen snow fall uh, in their lives, deci decided for the first time in their lives to have a massive snowball fight, and it and it eventually expanded to uh, it eventually expanded to uh, brigades fighting one another. Uh, uh, in the snowball fight in line battle. Cleburne led his old brigade uh, under Polk against uh, General Govan uh, and uh, was captured. He, he was paroled, quote-unquote, uh, sent back to uh, his command. He, he made another attack, was captured again, and uh, his, his men pretended to uh, put him on trial for, uh, for his disobedience and threatened to use some of the... Uh, some of the uh, disciplining tactics he had used against them, uh, because you know he he wasn't a soft disciplinarian by any stretch. Uh, his favorite uh, tactic uh, for uh, disobedient soldiers was to have them carry railroad uh, ties or railroad fences for for a mile uh, on a march. Uh, eventually, though. Uh, Oh, uh, he's let go on the uh, condition that uh, they, they have, he has to uh, give them good rations, and he, he agrees. And so that night, uh, he, he uh, hands out a brandy, uh, brandy and whiskey ration to his men. Sorry. Don't worry, I picked that up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I... I, I... That has very little to do with, with anything, but I, I just found that to be one of the funny little anecdotes of uh, of uh, Cleburne's life, and uh, you know, adds a little bit to him. That's uh, you know, if you just read the uh, straight histories of the campaigns, you you probably never get stories like that, which you know I could kind of appreciate. It, uh, uh, very important for. Um uh, very important for humanizing uh, uh, said figures. Yeah, you know, big on that. Yeah, and also the fact that it kind of shows why uh, uh, why he and his men kind of kind of got along. It be because that because uh, he he kind of got was on their same like like wavelength, I guess you could say. Like like I said, he wasn't like uh, low born. Um, he, he he was from middle class background in Ireland, but. Uh, he he had uh, he had risen through and uh, and he he kind of got uh, the uh, background of uh, his 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 men more than most you know aristocratic officers did. Uh, and this is why you get uh, that uh, painting like uh, you get at uh, uh, Franklin that depict him. Fighting on foot, even though it's inact, it's not what happened, uh, because because you know a lot of times artists try to depict him as like a, uh, a soldier's general, so, someone who uh, fights with the men, uh, shares their struggles, which which is kind of true true given his uh, you know camp life, uh, often uh, having to sleep in the same same uh, uh, tent, uh, same cot as a, a fellow officer of his. Uh, mostly to save space and uh, equipment. Uh, well, going into the uh, Atlanta campaign, uh, Cleburne's assigned to uh, Hardy's division uh, corps, which is uh, ridiculously oversized with uh, four divisions. 
Uh, by this point, his uh, division now numbers f uh, 5,200 men. Uh, he fights at uh, Buzzard Roost Gap uh, at the start of the campaign, uh, and attacked by uh, troops from Hooker's Corps. Uh, then as a diversion, uh, stalls out as uh, Cleburne reinforces the gap with uh, troops. Uh, however, this was a diversion for uh, McPherson's uh, maneuver, and so he's forced to withdraw back to uh, Rizaka. He helps repulse uh, uh, the 23rd Corps' attack uh, under Judah uh, in the center, but uh, sees very little action until uh, the battle of... until uh, the... Uh, they reach the New Hope line uh, in late May. On May 27th, he's on the far right flank of the army near a place called Pickett's Mill on a uh, piece of high ground uh, overlooking a ravine. It's here where uh, Oliver Otis Howard is sent to uh, launch a uh, flank attack on uh, the Confederate right to try and uh, turn the flank. Uh, however, Cleburne is able to redeploy uh, uh, Granbury's brigade to uh, uh, along the point of attack, and despite the fact they were unentrenched, they poured deadly volleys into the ranks of uh, uh, Hazen's uh, brigade, which just stopped right on its tracks. And uh, there's a vivid account of the battle, battle by uh, Ambrose Beers from uh, Hazen's staff. Uh, Ambrose Beers, the famous uh, post-war uh, writer. Uh, talking about uh, how you know bodies just piled up uh, yards in front front of the Confederate uh, line, which may be some embellishment, but uh, but given the situation, I I don't doubt it. it I've been to Pickett's Mill, and the terrain there is abysmal. Uh, you you'd never want to make an attack up that. Uh, yeah, he has a great uh, uh, Beers in that one. It's a kind of he has a great line about Hazen. Oh, one of my yeah. commanders. Uh, oh yeah, that whole paragraph about Hazen is the is probably one of the best like character sketches I've ever seen of the entire war. Yeah, I'm actually for the Shiloh book when Hazen shows up, I'm just block quoting the description, which I I, I don't use. I almost never use block quotes because uh, I don't like them. People usually skip them, but I find if you are if you're going to use them, use them very rarely in your book. I find when that happens. You're, the person's like more likely to read them. Like I just finished a Battle of New Orleans book, very few block quotes, but I ran into one. It was a great description of the battlefield. Um, but he has a great line there where he says that uh, duty was his religion, and like the Muslim, he prophesied with the sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hazen <laughs> is... Uh, I think it's because of Beers that Hazen is kind of one of my personal favorite of the Union, like lower commanders in uh, the West. Uh, uh, one thing to note uh, about, about Hazen, uh, at Chickamauga, it was his brigade that uh, repelled, that was at the center of uh, Cleburne's assault on the 20th. And uh, so it was kind of a reverse of that whole battle in many, way, in, uh, many ways for, uh, for the two of them. Uh, 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 the problem with the, with the battle oh, wow. is... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say it's not it's not the uh, complete one side. It's it's kind of a one sided affair for uh, the Confederates because of just how poorly handled the Union soul is and the terrain. Because brigades are sent in piecemeal, and and uh, Richard Johnson's division didn't even go in despite orders. Uh, Howard at one point is like wounded in, in the foot and uh, and is uh, put out. Is uh, put out on the side. It, it, it is a wait, poor Richard performance. Johnson, wait, Richard yeah. Johnson screwed up? Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Richard Johnson, one of the uh, Richard Johnson, maybe the fucking bait for uh, the Army of the Cumberland. Yeah, he sticks around the whole goddamn time. Um, and and but, I don't and know like, fucking the way, why this asshole sticks around so long. He fucks up at he fucks up at Furfiesboro. He, he he fucks up here. He fucks up in Nashville. Yeah. Well, I, I one thing I found was apparently Thomas liked. No, apparently oh, Thomas sense. liked him. 
Hey, well, I mean, yeah. I, hey, look, every every commander has a bonehead they like. So apparently, Thomas yeah. liked him. Yeah, apparently, Thomas uh, also liked Stedman, though. Though Stedman was, you know, braver than than Richard Johnson ever was. <laughs> Oh no, I, I I like Stedman. Stedman's hilarious. Um, his my one of my favorite generals is David Stanley because he's just so bitter and mean in his memoirs. And he called like Sta- he said Stedman was just like the Sultan of Chattanooga because apparently he just sat around <laughs> having nice dinners and he had a mistress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. So um, you know, but the, it, it, Richard Johnson, I don't get why he stuck around. And then to make matters worse, uh, I had to read part. I've read part of his memoirs years back. They're horrible. I mean, it's, they're so like they're just dripping with corniness. They're corny for that time. Yeah, it's terrible, man. Yeah. It just sticks around. <laughs> they should do that. You should write a biography of Richard Johnson called "The William Bate of the West: <laughs> The Life and Times of Richard Johnson." Or you could just call it "Dicking Around." <laughs> oh God, you're right. His name is. No, that's it. He's... So he's the Bushrod Johnson of the army. Is what you're telling me. Oh, <laughs> uh, Richard. Bushrod Johnson at least was like. Bushrod Johnson had good days at least. Well, like, like he oh, did he, no, great he, at like Chickamauga at least. Not that. No, Bushrod. No, Bushrod Johnson was a good commander. I just meant he's also the same guy's name is essentially penis penis. <laughs> God, I never noticed that. Well, <laughs> Wait, had you not noticed that his name is Richard Johnson? Uh, but also, <laughs> I, I am very uncultured. It seems, despite uh, uh, I mean, immediately as soon as you said his name, that's exactly what I thought of. Well, that's because uh, that's because you grew up in a steady diet of Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Richard Johnson and Bushrod. But anyways, um, yeah, so okay, it's a reversal for uh, Pickett's Mill. Um, what's our next slaughterhouse? Uh, oh, boy. Speaking of, uh, you know, Sherman and not uh, making frontal assaults on uh, uh, well-fortified positions, Kennesaw Mountain. Oh, oh yeah. Boy. He gets frustrated. He gets frustrated, I think, because he hasn't been doing it for so long. I think he was like, well, God damn it, let me see what happens. Oh, wait, that's why I don't like this idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's shit like that where I, 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 I am not a, uh, I'm not in the, Sherman was a secretly complete genius camp. I, I do think way more highly of Sherman than I do of Grant, because it didn't fall into the, you know, constant, like, boneheaded assault again and again and again. Like, yeah, uh, Grant in the Overland. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Can you imagine Sherman trying to do the Overland campaign in Georgia? <laughs> oh God! Yeah, yeah. Then, then we'd be talking about the military genius of Joe Johnston. Well, then we'd be talking about like the Battle of Nashville. You know, be like the book, be like the Battle of Nashville: colon, when Lincoln lost the election. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, at, at Kennison in particular. Uh, uh, most the most famous action was at uh, Cheatham Hill because that was held by uh, uh, Cheatham's division, uh, where uh, the dead angle. Yeah, uh, there the assault by uh, uh, Colonel Daniel McCook occurred against uh, Manny's brigade, famously uh, remembered by. Uh, uh, there's a famous account by uh, what was his name, uh, Sam Watkins of uh, the First Tennessee Manny's brigade. Uh, yeah, it's very, yeah, that's a very, uh, very potent account. Yeah, very. yeah. Appar- uh, apparently, uh, the soldiers in, in that trench were uh, chanting "Chickamauga" the entire the entire battle as uh, as Union troops came came up. Uh, I, uh, me, but at the same time, there was another assault, assault to uh, Cheatham's right against Cleburne's line by uh, Newton's division. Uh, it's here that uh, Charles Harker, the uh, uh, one of the heroes of uh, Chickamauga, uh, who helped uh, establish the uh, uh, Thomas's new right uh, when uh, the collapse occurred, uh, he was killed uh, in the charge, uh, shot off his horse. Uh, 
I forget the exact casualty numbers, but it's but uh, Cleburne only lost nineteen men, and I believe uh, Newton lost five hundred thousand ish. I I I did not write good notes for for uh, this stream, but uh, but I just remember that uh, it it was kind kind of it was one of the most one sided affairs I've ever read about. Damn. Yeah, though, though by this point it should be noted, uh, before this action, uh, uh, Lucius Polk, the, uh, 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 the guy who commanded Cleveland's old brigade, was uh, wounded. He lost his leg and was out of action for the rest of the war, which means the only good Polk was gone. Uh, and his brigade was suspended, and so Cleveland was reduced to three brigades for the rest for uh, most of the rest of the conflict. And by this point, Cleveland's division was reduced to about thirty seven hundred men uh, going into going uh, into retreat to Atlanta. Uh, so yeah, this is despite you know relatively low losses. Like the heaviest loss of life he uh, experienced was at uh, was at Pickett's Mill, where he lost about four hundred men to uh, Howard's sixteen hundred. Uh, I, I didn't make mention of that. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, uh, that's kind of. I mean, think about that. Thirty-seven hundred. He's he's getting close to the size of his brigade at Shiloh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By this point, the uh, Confederate army was kind of withering away. That that's kind of a thing that I disagree with a lot of people when uh, they say that. Oh, Joe, Joe Johnson kept the ar army intact. It was like, yeah, but it's been weathered down uh, uh, over, over time. And especially in, like, units that haven't seen heavy action, like Polk's Corps, like, a lot, like, the divisions there, like, have steadily decreased in numbers. Like, I think he started out with 20,000 men, and by the time his corps under Stuart uh, reaches Atlanta, uh, the number is just, like, 11,000. Even, even yeah, though they haven't, they, well, they haven't gotten well, they haven't gotten as many replacements because Lee well, Lee's getting a lot of replacements because he's getting hammered quite a bit. But even Lee is not getting as many replacements as you'd think. So the replacement system's starting to fall apart. Um, also, there's a lot of desertion in the Army of Tennessee, especially among the Georgia regiments, uh, which is not surprising yeah, I can tell. because. Yeah, they they want to yeah, either want to go home or they, like is yeah. it loses half its strength by the time it reaches uh, Atlanta. It, it's it's yeah. and that division is entirely Georgians essentially. Yeah, there's there's been there's a lot of push and pull on this. Like I've read one book about Granbury's Texans, where the guy was making the case. It's a good book, but he was making the case that. You know, the Confederates never really lost the will to fight until the end, and the Confederate desertion thesis is overstated. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're talking about in a brigade that became elite. Like, why don't you go... I, actually, my review said that argument needs to be compared to other brigades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's so, the thing. Yeah, Granbury's it, brigade were very, by that point, very enthused. Mostly because what was left of it were the diehards. Uh, left in, in the unit after all oh, the yeah. travails, and also a lot of these men were kind of—I uh, I, won't—I won't say personally loyal to Cleburne because that makes it sound like they're uh, like like his uh, personal legion, but they—they they have a strong attachment to their commanders, and uh, it's, it's for that reason a lot of them stick around despite all the chaos that will ensue, and why a lot of them—and the thing yeah, is, like of. I, I, I do say that like the army decreased uh, in strength, but it, it does seem that oh, that uh, as uh, after the July battles, uh, the army slowly increased in, in number of certain divisions, like uh, Cleburne's. Uh, uh, his numbers uh, went went up over time, even even factoring out like the transfer of like uh, the Savannah Brigade into uh, his unit. Uh, he, his command was starting to increase in numbers. Uh, I I think it may be because a lot of the army's dealing with stragglers over this long, arduous march 
across uh, Georgia, Georgia weather. That, that may also be the big factor here. Just... No, it's because Hood's awesome. That's why they're coming back. <laughs> well, well, in some, well, maybe in some, like two guys did did on that case, but that's <laughs> it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, speaking speaking of which, by this point, uh, Cleburne had been passed over for a promotion. Uh, well. Uh, by this point, uh, Leonidas Polk had been uh, killed, and uh, he was being replaced by A.P. Stewart, despite A.P. Stewart being lower in rank and having having a less interesting uh, record than Cleburne's. Uh, big reason for this is that, you know, uh, Stewart had West Point education and uh, Cleburne did not. And, and also the fact that uh, he had, uh, you know, uh, he was a Tennessean, and uh, the Army of Tennessee he didn't really have many high-ranking Tennessee officers besides Cheatham. That's a good point made there. It, it also, it, he has a good record, too. You know, they're, they're not... They're not promoting... Uh, they're not promoting, like... <laughs> they're yeah, not promoting no, Carter no. Stevens. I, I'm not saying Stewart's a complete moron uh, uh, in this case... I, I'm just say, saying it's it's it should be noted that uh, he, he was junior to Cleveland uh, by, by uh, several months, uh, and, and I don't think his record was as you know, uh, well was was as stellar as Cleveland's was up to this point. Though, though Cleveland, of course, has has its failings, yeah. and uh, sort of his no, own highs. Yeah, I just meant that the I just meant, the, I just meant posting him is not seen as egregious. You know, I mean, yeah. By the same token, uh, Benjamin Cheatham is uh, senior to all of these guys at this point. Yeah. I mean, Cheatham's been leading division since Shiloh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll get to. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I will say, Stewart. I can understand and his appointment, but there's another appointment that we'll get to later. That I, I entirely argue that Cleveland is 100 percent was more deserving of than this guy, and you know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, but anyways, oh, yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. It, it anyways, Johnson, yeah, he's. I, I genuinely think that guy's the worst general on the Confederate side, uh, on his level of command. But, uh, we'll, we'll, but we'll get to him, anyways. Joe Johnston, uh, he, he, he does what he always does and pisses off, uh, Davis, uh, needlessly. Uh, though, of course, you know, Davis isn't helping either. And uh, instead of telling him his actual plan to uh, defeat each Sherman, uh, Johnson uh, decides to give vague, very non-committal answers to uh, ask to the question what his strategy is against Sherman. What is after Davis bluntly asked him, and for this, uh, according to the Hess, this is why Davis finally relieved him. And so uh, Hood takes command of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, Hood uh, launches uh, uh, the attack uh, at Petrie Creek on the uh, 20th of July. Cleburne is held in reserve uh, on the right flank. They, they suffer casualties from uh, artillery bombardment, uh, about 100 uh, killed or wounded from, uh, the, sh from uh, the cannons on the opposite bank of the, uh, the creek. But uh, they aren't engaged, uh, as uh, by the end of the battle, Hood decides, uh, given uh, reports from Wheeler from uh, the east of, of the city, to send them to uh, reinforce Wheeler against uh, McPherson's push. Uh, here, Cleburne fights uh, against uh, 17th Corps, uh, which itself was no bigger than a division, about 9,000 men large division, we'll say, though. Uh, they, they, attack, they attack his position, which is poorly in place, and uh, the and uh, Union Artillery is able to enflade uh, the Confederate entrenchments, and they inflict about 140 casualties on the Texas Brigade alone. I think their total casualties in the battle is like 260, 250. Uh, wow. 
most of that is from artillery. At least, at least according to uh, James Argyle Smith, uh, though, though his battle report is is questionable, considering he uh, was was wounded the next day and didn't didn't have a full grasp of uh, of the situation then or the next day. But we'll get to that. Uh, uh, the Union managed to take the hill, uh, mainly due to the efforts of uh, the brigade under. Brigadier Manning Force, who has the best name of this in tot of in all of American history. Yeah. <laughs> Manning uh, Force. Yeah. It sounds like an uh, action star from the eighties. One of the guys who yeah. be on the like Shadow Stevens level. <laughs> Manning Force. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So many good. Think Gordon named uh, Americus V. Rice. Really fun names. That's pretty good. One. Yeah, I mean, we've already talked about States' rights guest, yeah. guest, of course. Um, my personal favorite is yeah. Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana. You're like, wow, and your dad had hype. Oh, yeah. I know. Ago, I, yeah, that one. <laughs> that's a... <laughs> yeah, that mouthful. was good, though. That's. <laughs> Yeah. So, so nah, anyways, uh, no nah, man, whatever. The best is Bushrod Johnson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, Bushrod Johnson's great. Um, all right, In, all right. So the Confederates lose control of Bald Hill, which is a uh, high ground right outside of uh, the city of Atlanta. Uh, Cleveland falls back into the uh, defenses of the city itself, and Hood devises a plan to uh, strike. McPherson's flank. Uh, initially, he wants to move, march them all around and down to the Decatur and strike them in the rear, but Hardy says, no, that that's too absurd. We can't do that. Let's just strike them in the flank. Uh, and, and so Hart, Hardy marches, uh, and on July 22nd, the, the uh, actual Battle of Bald Hill occurs. Uh, Things go poorly on the right flank because Bate just sends in his troops without uh, any oversight, and they just get mauled by a single brigade in a, in a uh, section of artillery. Uh, Walker's division uh, does better. Uh, mostly Giss Brigade aid does because Giss is the only good brig brigadier in that, that command. Uh, and also the fact that the other units just... Uh, like the... Uh, Mercer's Brigade, uh, made up of uh, guys from the, uh, the city of Savannah, Georgia, who had not seen any combat. Uh, they are one of the worst brigades in the Army of Tennessee, by far, with, without doubt. Uh, yeah, they, they sit around and do nothing while, uh, while another brigade under uh, Colonel Nisbet just gets chewed up and an entire regiment gets captured. Uh, Walker gets... Walker gets killed after leading a charge by uh, one of uh, Stu uh, State's right it's Gist's regiments, and Gist is wounded himself, and so that attack falls apart. Uh, and then Cleburne makes his attack on Bald Hill itself. Uh, he overlaps the uh, flank of the 17th Corps, which isn't supported by, uh, which isn't connected to uh, any units by six by uh, 16th Corps. Uh, and, and so he's able to overrun and capture two entire regiments and uh, force uh, the Union line back. Uh, he is he is able to attack uh, Bald Hill from behind, but uh, Mortimer Leggett's men, uh, well, the men from Mortimer Leggett's division, uh, jump over the walls and shoot into uh, the attacking Confederates. It's around this time that uh, General McPherson marches to the front run, and runs into uh, uh, a band of Confederate soldiers from Cleburne's division, uh, members of the 5th Confederate, uh, the uh, Irish Regiment, uh, formerly known as uh, Walker's 2nd Tennessee. Uh, you may have heard of them, uh, Sean, uh, from your uh, Shiloh reading. Uh, they're, they're made up of uh, Irishmen from uh, the city of Memphis, most uh, 
uh, and they had been assigned to uh, Grant to uh, uh, Smith's brigade. Uh, they or they order uh, McPherson to halt, but he turns turns around and tries to ride off, but is killed. And and so Cleveland decapitates the uh, Union High Command for some time. He also manages to capture a bunch of uh, of equipment, uh, about three hundred men, uh, and one uh, brigade commander, Cur Colonel Robert Scott, who was uh, returning from a uh, returning from a uh, uh, detail. Uh, Scott was actually the commander of the of uh, the brigade that was holding uh, uh, Bald Hill itself, and so his brigade uh, was continuing on without a, without a commander. Uh, but uh, Cleburne's assault uh, uh, was falling apart because it started to dissipate, and the uh, brigade commanders were going in one at a time. Uh, Mark Lowery's brigade got decimated. I think out of a uh, I, I did the math of uh, they probably had around thirteen hundred men going into the battle, and they lost about five hundred eighty-eight. Uh, I, I for, uh, meanwhile, I think like uh, Granbury's brigade lost three hundred, and uh, and uh, Govan's lost another five hundred. Uh, took. Uh, attacks keep going in and out. Uh, uh, action dies down as Cleveland pulls back to reform. Uh, he prepares for a uh, late late attack. Uh, meanwhile, Brown's assault goes off in the north and uh, briefly breaks through the line, but uh, is eventually sealed. Uh, Cleveland is able to organize a new attack with uh, the few fresh brigades left. Uh, uh, he leads uh, Manny's brigade personally in, into a charge against uh, Bald Hill itself, uh, 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 but it's futile. Uh, the temporary commander of that brigade, uh, Colonel Francis Walker, is killed, and uh, the battle comes to an comes to a close. Uh, casualties were heavy. Uh, I, I I noted the cas I noted that. Uh, uh, Ferrets, well, Cleveland had lost around 1,300 men, 1,400-ish men in, in the battle out of at about 3,500 that he had uh, gone in by that point with after all the uh, casualties from uh, the previous two days' actions. It, it, it was a bloodbath, to say, to say the least, for uh, Cleveland and uh, his... his <laughs> yeah, Yeah. After this, his command does is uh, brought back to the main line. They they recover their strength from uh, returning wounded and uh, and uh, stragglers returning from uh, the sick sick beds. Uh, during this time, however, uh, uh, someone arrives to take command of Hood's corps, and that guy is S. D. Lee. And this guy is completely worthless in in, in this role. Yeah. Oh, uh, think so. I, I, I don't know about well, that. I, I'll say he kind of improves, <laughs> but barely. Uh, especially considering his track record thus far, he did not deserve this promotion. Uh, no, he does not deserve this promotion. It's really weird to me. I mean, before this, he had he had commanded artillery in Virginia effectively. Um, he led a brigade in the Vicksburg campaign very effectively. Yeah, he also uh, was so the he, guy who uh, defeated Sherman at Chickasaw Bayou. So. Yeah, that's his big claim to fame. Uh, but no, no, he, he then gets, he then becomes like the department commander who oversees the Battle of Tupelo, which is just harebrained and yeah. just gets a bunch of men killed. And uh, you know, his reward for uh, bungling this battle is to be made a corps commander? What, what I've heard is, I, I, I've heard, I, I think... I must have been mis misreading S, but apparently uh, he may have sent a misleading report that implied that he did way better than uh, he actually did. And so for that, it was like, okay, you know what? Uh, he's, he's young. Uh, he seems to have energy. He seems to be doing well. Let's put him in command. And it's a terrible mistake. 
that this is the case where I say, yeah, Cleveland should have gotten that core absolutely without without contests. Uh, him or Cheatham or Richard Taylor? Yeah, certainly. Taylor probably less so because he has uh, health problems around this time. I, I doubt he. I, I don't know if he was in he really fit condition is. to really command at this time. Maybe he wasn't at that very moment. He is very. Um, he is also very prickly, to be sure. But I mean, all three of those men, assuming Taylor's in fine health or at least good enough, all three yeah. of those men have lots of experience, better combat records overall. I know Cheatham has his problems, and he's actually not a good yeah. core commander. But yeah, but I can understand we'll, we'll why you. Feel like, yeah, but I can also understand why you would give it to Cheatham since he's been around forever. You know. Um, Anyways, but anyway, anyhow, so so yeah, it's, now they got Stephen D. Lee, who's been called the Forrest Gump of the Confederacy. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, honestly, I, I think that is an insult to Forrest Gump because Forrest Gump will be smarter than this man. Oh come on, this guy's good at artillery and infantry brigades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, he well, was, he was the Lee who was yeah. not part of the same family as Robert E. Lee, right? No, no, uh, no. They're, they're very not related. Probably distantly, super distantly related, but I, I don't think at all. Like his name had anything to do with his promotion. Okay, because I know that you know Fitzhugh Lee was his nephew, and I used to get that confused back when I'd play the uh, Civil War general game. Uh, because S D yeah. also appears in the game, and I could, uh, it always took me a while to remember who was Lee's relative and who was just the other Lee. Yeah, then it gets more confusing when you have uh, Rooney Lee, who is his who is his young who is uh, his youngest son, and George Custis Lee, who is his oldest son and also a general barely. Yeah. There's a lot of nepotism so anyway, in uh, Virginia, for sure. Yeah, you know you got to trust your um, your family. You got a whole family trust thing going on. I mean. Uh, yeah, I, the other one that would be like the Creoles of Louisiana, those old Creole families. They always intermarry. Um, you know, they're always like making sure they got each other's back. They got families go back generations around here. But anyway, so I know like Stephen D. Lee becomes a Corps commander. He does very poorly at Ezra Church. Oh, yeah. Um, and Claiborne's not there, though. We got to get to Jonesboro. Jonesboro. All right. Uh, I should note, but uh, at this time, uh, b before we carry on, uh, one last change to uh, the command and occurs. Uh, I mean, there's minor changes here and there, but uh, uh, because of uh, Walker's death, uh, the Savannah Brigade, uh, formerly under Mercer, was transferred to Cleveland's command. Mercer uh, retired basically at this point because he was too old and too sickly to command, and so it went to Colonel Charles Olmsted. Who, who is one of the dumbest uh, Confederate Brigade commanders of the entire war. Uh, and wow. Cle Eber knew that, and he wanted to find a guy to take command into the unit because, because it was just terrible, and it needed a good commander. But uh, he didn't have any on hand. Eventually, you go to James Argyle Smith, uh, but really it had no real impact uh, on any uh, battles going forward. It, well, to some extent, it will at Jonesboro, but barely. Uh, anyways, Jonesboro. Sherman uh, launches his final offensive. He He's marching down to cut the uh, final Southern Railroad uh, leading out of Atlanta, the last one, uh, the last one operating to supply uh, Hood's army. Uh, Hood sends a party with uh, his corps and S.D. Lee's corps to... Uh, stop this advance, and uh, they uh, corner uh, all of Otis Howard's uh, army of the Tennessee along the Flint River near the uh, junction of Jonesboro. Uh, Hood wants Hardy to attack. The problem is, uh, by this point, Hood and Hardy hate each other completely, and Hardy is a uh, terrible, well, uncreative tactician, let's say. And, and so, uh, his plan of attack is to uh, launch in echelon, starting with, uh, starting with uh, his corps under Cleburne, because Cheatham's off uh, 
on leave, and uh, Cleaver is now the senior commander. Uh, Cleaver, uh, Cleaver would launch an attack with uh, his division under Lori, promoted to division command temporarily. Uh, then it would go up the ranks from the from the south up uh, to uh, base division under Brown, uh, John C. Brown, who we'll get to later. Uh, and it, it would then George, George Manny's division would be in reserve, and then SD Lee's uh, corps would attack uh, as it heard the the uh, sounds of the guns. The problem is, uh, Cleveland went forward. He engaged uh, Joseph and Kilpatrick's cavalry, and SD Lee interpreted this sound as a signal and launched his attack. And his core, uh, well, it wasn't a fun day for anyone there. Uh, his, his command was decimated. Uh, not to the extent it was at Ezra Church, because most of the, most of the troops backed off because they realized just how stupid this whole affair was. Uh, but uh, he did suffer heavy casualties. Uh, meanwhile, uh, because of uh, the harrying by uh, Kilpatrick's cavalry, uh, Granbury's brigade uh, veered off and uh, followed uh, Kilpatrick's cavalry to, to the river instead of continuing to uh, turn the flank to uh, towards the main line. And this pulled off the entirety of Cleveland's division on the attack, and so only Brown's division was going in. And uh, Brown suffered uh, s some losses, but uh, eventually uh, Cleveland pulled back to reform. He was going to launch another attack with Manny's division, but Hardy called off the assault because he realized just how useless it was now. Uh, Hood recalled Hood, uh, Lee's corps to uh, Atlanta because he feared that uh, it was all the diversion to uh, take Atlanta while uh, he was weak. And this left Hart already isolated uh, around Jonesboro. Uh, Cle uh, Cleburne aligned his men, uh, but it, there, there was a, a weak point in the line uh, where uh, Govan's brigade was. And it was here that uh, the 14th Corps under uh, Jefferson Davis, yes, Jefferson C. Jefferson C. Davis, uh, attacked. And it was here that uh, 600 men from uh, Govan's brigade and uh, a battery of artillery were captured, along with the banners of most of uh, that brigade. Only the 5th, uh, 13th Arkansas, the boys, uh, the guys who had uh, fought at uh, Ringgold Gap. Uh, they were the only ones that remained, and uh, they helped form a new line. Uh, and uh, Cleveland was able to pull troops from uh, his far left to seal the breach. Uh, he, he was helped by the fact that uh, Howard was supposed to support the attack and prevent. Uh, such a move uh, from weakening the line. But uh, Howard did literally nothing. He just sat there all day, staring. And so uh, at, at night, uh, Hardy withdrew uh, to uh, Lovejoy Station and gave up the field. That night, uh, Hood prepared to evacuate. Uh, well, actually, no, it was the night of the fir first day that Hood started evacuating Atlanta. Uh, this was Cleburne's only time in Corps Command, and it's um, cer certainly a mixed uh, bag. On the, on the one hand, it's not, you know, masterwork, but I, I'd argue that he... Uh, I, I argue that he was in a bad situation and he made the best that he could of it. Uh the the the, uh, the fuck up with uh, with uh, Laurie and uh, Granbury on uh, on the first day that that was mostly due to inexperience by uh, the commanders there and also the fact that Lee, that uh, SD Lee is a complete fucking moron and and uh, the in the second day that battle should not have been fought uh, but Hardy stayed anyway. Uh, and e e even though there was a breakthrough uh, in his line, Cleburne was able to contain it. Uh, th though a lot of that had to do with the inaction of uh, of uh, Howard. 
I, I I'd say for his one time in Cork, man, it, it's it's a it's a good it's a decent C of a job. I I I I, I can see an argument for a D, but no lower. Uh, F. <laughs> I'm <giving> F. <laughs> no, no, it's it's a tough position. It's a tough position to be in, you know. Uh, I'd uh, I'd 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 say a C. I just the question I have is, I mean, nobody gives them super high marks. I think very people give them low marks, but uh, I mean, or like you know, abysmal marks, but it's not great. But I, I think the question is. Does this does this performance influence um, when they have to look for Hardy's replacement and they go with Cheatham? Uh, I am not entirely certain. I, I I get the feeling that Cheatham was put in place as a temporary solution because he, after all, he is the senior most commander. But he wasn't even promoted to lieutenant general. Uh, he he just remained uh, uh, to division command rank, but. Uh, he, since he was a senior one, they didn't even have to promote him. Hmm. I didn't realize yeah. that. I always, I always assumed hmm. that yeah, like, Cheatham was a full core commander. Uh, no, not really. Even even though it it, it kind of was, but he wasn't given the full rank. It, it seems I, I I I see it more as just a half measure. It seems no one wanted to solve to. To really put their foot down on the whole situation. You know, in the case of Cheatham, um, I mean, I think, I think if what 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 it was dependent on is how well Cheatham would do, and of course he's the main author of the failure at Spring Hill. Oh yeah, and, Green Jacobson. Yeah, uh, well, that yeah. I want to get to that. That 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 is a. Fucking travesty! What he what he did there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So. So no, man. It's just um. Uh, it's it's. I guess on the other end, if 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 somehow Claiborne does well at Jonesboro, then maybe he does get the core command. Yeah. Well, I, I say he did well. I I, I just think I that uh, he he just got passed over in in the end. No no one was really confident in him, and the only the only guys who would bat for him were Hinman, who who would be who was disabled and out of the war, and Hardy, who who was too pissed off with uh, Hood to even consider such thing such uh such a move, and, and was too busy focusing on getting transferred. Hmm. All right. So, what's our next one? Yeah, we already talked about the the Dalton episode. Uh, at, at, uh soon after the battle, uh, uh, Govan's men were uh, exchanged uh, because uh, uh, Sherman wanted Stoneman back for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, he when, keeps getting jobs. I don't get it. Yeah, me neither. I really don't. No, he yeah. does. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Hood attempts to operate against the uh, the uh, Western Atlantic Railway going from uh, Chattanooga to Atlanta, hoping to cut off Sherman's supply line and force him into battle in North Georgia. Doesn't work, and his army starts starving. Uh, this this is where the battle, the infamous Battle of Alexandria Gap occurs, and uh, the. The uh, second battle of Dalton, I believe, where uh, where the incident with uh, the forty fourth USC key occurs, as I mentioned before, uh, I, I haven't read much about Cleburne's personal like involvement in it. Uh, uh, it is mentioned in the biographies, but it doesn't seem that uh, we have any accounts about his uh, any orders he gave or any really opinions he had. Uh, about the whole situation, I, I, I get the feeling he would have been more upset about it than uh, you know Bait would, because as we pointed out, Bait Bait was really gung ho about mm. murdering all those N words. 
<laughs> God damn. Yeah. Ugh, what a yeah. horrible... Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, 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 Anyways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I bring this um, up because we're we're gonna get to the one moment where where I I, I where I have to side with fate. Uh, anyways, uh, Hood moves to Alabama no, and starts no. preparing for. Yeah, we'll we'll get to we'll get to Spring Hill. Uh, Hood moves to uh, Tennessee, uh, moves to uh, Northern Alabama and prepares for his invasion of Tennessee. Late November, he uh, marches up. Uh, takes Columbia, but uh, sees across the Duck River, uh, Shawfield's entrenched. Uh, and he decides to do a large uh, flanking maneuver led by uh, Cheatham's Corps with Cleveland in the lead uh, in order to cut the uh, Columbia Pike, uh, hoping that this would A, allow him to uh, get the march on... Uh, Get the march on Shawfield and get to Nashville with without a scratch. Still thinking that Nashville was undefended for some reason. And B force uh, Shawfield to use uh, alternative routes that were uh, that were slower and thus give him an opportunity to uh, cut him off at the march. Uh, similar to what he was trying to do to Sherman, uh, but uh, with probably a higher chance of succeeding. Uh, his his Hood's orders at uh, when it, when he gets to Spring Hill are kind of confusing. Uh, it's obvious that he intended to, to cut the uh, the pike as his objective, but he pointed to Spring Hill itself, the the uh, the village, and uh, the commanders on the ground assumed, "Oh, he wants us to take take the village. We we need to take Spring Hill village," and that is the objective. And so Cle Cleburne uh, prepares his his men and makes an attack. Uh, he overruns uh, Br Bradley's brigade of uh, Wagner's division. Uh, we're, we're, you're going to remember this guy, George Wagner. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Bradley's brigade, uh, uh, they do damage against uh, 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 Laurie's brigade because, uh, because uh, they, they weren't initially marching towards uh, that part of the flank. Uh, but... Eventually, uh, they're overrun because most of the men are uh, made up of uh, conscripts by this point due to their losses in the campaign. Just keep in mind, this is the same division that made the attack at uh, Kennesaw Mountain against uh, Cleveland's division and suffered ridiculously lopsided casualties. Uh, uh, however, they, the uh, Union troops reform. Uh, Cleveland prepares for another assault, but... Uh, Cheatham orders him to halt uh, and to prepare for a, uh, a, con a coordinated assault with uh, Brown's division. And of course, there's all the stuff with Brown's division on, on, on that flank. And I, I've heard, I've had arguments with uh, a guy named Gunny on uh, uh, the Civil War talks. He has his own book about, about uh, the campaign. Disagrees with Jacobson on a lot of points. Says that, like, uh, uh, Brown was justified be, uh, be, because of uh, there. There were actually Union troops on, on his flank. He was actually way weaker than uh, than a lot of accounts uh, of, of the battle pointed out to be. That he had like one thousand five hundred men actually available because most of his troops were off on furlough because many of them were from the area, never been home, never been home for over a year. Yeah, I had heard that was a major problem with the Tennessee regiments. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Gunny, what's, what's the name of this book? I'll, I'll need to pull up the... Uh, uh, he, he posted it. Uh, we had a DM chat about it, and uh, he, post, he posted a link to it, so hold on. Okay. It's called 25 Hours Tragedy. It's uh, got the link. Okay. I'll take a look at that. Uh, anyways, so what do you think on Spring Hill? Um, well, 
but before I continue, I do want to point out one other incident that doesn't get as as much attention. Uh, everyone focuses on Cleburne's assault and Brown's uh, dawdling, but uh, on uh, Cleburne's uh, left, Bate actually briefly controls the pike. He's actually sitting right on it. His skirmishers are, are pushed out. Uh, he has very little resistance whatsoever, uh, because in Cleburne's front, there's there's a, an artillery uh, a battalion to his front, uh, preventing uh, Grand Bruce Brigade from just taking the pipe egg out right in their first uh, assault. Uh, Bate doesn't have any of that. He controls the pike and has basically achieved Hood's basic objective. Uh, however, uh, Cheatham uh, orders him to fall back and join up with Cleburne's line uh, in order to uh, go through with his, his old plan. However, Bates uh, realizes this is stupid and sends a courier back to uh, uh, to tell, tell him the situation, and, and Cheatham berates that, that cur courier for, for dis for uh, Bates' disobedience, and, and threatens to have, have Bates arrested if he if he continues to disagree with him. And so Bates is forced to abandon the Pike because of Cheatham's like adamant stupidity. The thing is, like Cheatham's not like alone in the guilt here because uh, Jacobson points out that uh, Hood was present for for this dressing down, and he could have corrected the could have corrected the order. But it seems like he just was out of it by this point, or just did not understand what was happening. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's def it it's definitely says a lot about how fucked up this whole debacle was on so many levels. I, I think like the big issue with Spring Hill is that. It would not have led to like ultimate Confederate victory, or they, they wouldn't have won the campaign. But it, it would have put them in a better position, and it would have probably prevented Franklin from occurring. Because if they take the Pike, and uh, Shawfield starts marching up that, uh, runs in, into Confederate troops in the middle of the night, and that's going to be chaos. Uh, Shawfield's going to have to have to reorganize and double back and march down a different road, like the. Carter Carter Creek Pike or one of the other side roads, while uh, while Hood can march straight on to uh, Franklin, uh, almost un unmolested by any Union forces in, in his path. It 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 could have been like the last Confederate victory of the war. It it, it could have been it could have been a moment of you know. I, I, I don't know. The thing is, it, it just the pe the problem that people have with this whole whole uh, debacle is that is less to do with what could have been done. I feel, and more what it could have prevented, namely the the slaughter at Franklin, above all else. Yeah, I think though, in some ways, that's debatable because. Essentially, <clears throat> the Confederates, and this has to do with, so a lot of this has to do with Jefferson Davis. Davis is just not quitting. He has no concept or idea of this. This is this is because he has an iron will, and an iron will can work out really well, but you know, it doesn't make you look like an idiot. So both Confederate armies need to be slaughtered. It's depressing and sad the way this one goes down. It's like a, it's, I call it the Confederate Culloden, but I mean, Lee's army's gonna get the shit whipped out of it in April, March and April, and suffer yeah. horrendous casualties. Uh, and yeah, and that's that also defensive because, for them, which is yeah. But also, I mean, by that time, get Sherman bearing down on you, and you know, being fair to Lee, I, I mean, I would look more into Lee's mentality going to eighteen sixty five. But I, I get the feeling that it's a man who's carrying out his duty, but he knows. He's, he's not stupid. But at the same time, people would be like, well, why doesn't he just like end the war? It's like, well, he can't because civilian control of the military is a big deal back then. I mean, it's a big deal right now, too, but I'd say it's even bigger back then. Um, 
it's one of the reasons why at the end of the Civil War and just about every war until actually we until the Korean War really we demobilized. Even into World War II, we demobilized the majority, the vast majority of our forces. You know, until the, it's really until the 1950s that Americans had this idea we always had to have a massive bloated military. Uh, so you know, Lee can go to Davis. He might be able to like say like, hey, maybe we should call it quits, but even that might be going too far in some ways. Um, you got a guy like Hood in charge. Eventually, your army is just going to have to be slaughtered. I hate to say it, but if they get to Franklin, if I'm not mistaken, Hood's intention was not to force Schofield to fight him. Schofield can get around him, actually. I mean, it's not easy, but he can still get around him. There's there's more roads to, to Nashville than through Franklin. So I think what, if I'm mistaken, what Hood's thing was, was then to race to Nashville and take and overtake the position. Well, that's not going to work. A Andrew Jackson Smith's core of veterans is going to be there before they could get there. Yeah. And it's not like there's nobody in Nashville. Now, don't yeah, and even without yeah. like the 16th Corps, like there's a decent garrison in there. Like not first-rate troops by any stretch, but they're good enough to hold out. Yeah. Yeah, and one bad situation you want to be in would be trying to assault a position and being in the middle of a battle when Schofield or Smith arrived. Oh yeah, and you're kind of surrounded on multiple angles by a garrison in Murfreesboro, uh, Shawfield coming coming up from the other angle to to, to the south, uh, AJ Smith Smith arriving by boat. Yeah, that that is. That that's the reason why I I, I understand, and, and I kind of agree with the whole uh, hood is a strategic idiot uh, thesis. <laughs> like, like he's better than Joe uh, Johnson, yeah. I I feel, but but he is also, wow, you 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 really thought that was a brilliant idea, sir. Well, they had to, they had to move out sooner than they did, and some of that's not even Hood's fault that they moved out as late as they did. But um, quite a bit of it actually, because Forrest was late getting in. But you know, it's just that um, um, Hood is um, like the offensive he's undertaking is one a lot of Confederates had considered. It has some merits. It's just coming at a point when there is no point. And the North does have some nervousness at the time because the Northern economy is not doing so good at this point, and there's some worry about Sherman because he's marching through Georgia without any supplies. But you know, come on. I mean, it, it's sad to say, there's probably going to have to be a slaughter to convince. And even then, I mean, what happens? Like Davis still wants to fight even after Lee surrenders. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's absurd. Just. Honestly, if I ever write a book about uh, the Civil War in eighteen, like in the later part, where where after the election when it's all but over and yet they still go, I'm just gonna title that book "City of Delusion" because that's essentially what what I feel that they were kind of in. Yeah, there's there's definitely a degree of that. I mean, yeah, at least I can. Hood, there's like this the desperate game going on. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, definitely the high command. I'd say even Beauregard has uh, uh, has his shared delusions right now. This is not one of Beauregard's finer moments. Is his Western Theater Command? Um, I think that's I think that's fair to say. Um, but you know, I mean, I I kind of think after the summer of eighteen sixty three, the Confederates have zero chance. So, you know. <laughs> Like, 1864 to me, uh, I'm, I'm like, what are you going to do? Elect McClellan, the guy who says he's going to keep fighting the war? I mean, don't get me wrong. I know he he's gonna he would try to fight the war to a conclusion that would be softer than Lincoln's, but he's still going to try to, you know, win the war. Right? So, right. Uh, I remember reading, uh, there's a few Confederates I've read, they said that the moment McClellan renounced the peace platform, I knew it was over. Uh, so, you know, it's, just, you know, l losing Vicksburg, Gettysburg, Port Hudson, and Tullahoma all in that short period of time, and all four of those are major strategic victories. Uh, the Confederates never recover from that. If you want yeah, Chattanooga, no. might be like 
the Chattanooga Chickamauga thing might be like the last desperate moment when they could have done something, but uh, you know, once that's over, I I think I think it's all waste after that. But you know, try. To, but I guess they'll get like a peace Democrat nominated. Maybe that's what they're hoping yeah. for. But I, I think yeah, that's by the, it's true. By that is true. Who on it, earth will they get to, to nominate that? That that would be a hardline peace. Uh, Democrat who, who who people would actually vote for, not some like extremist like uh, Clement Valendigam or or any other other like crazy copperheads. I mean, there's Seymour. He's one of the more popular ones, and he got nominated in 1868, even though he didn't want to. Which oh, you boy. know about that story, right? <laughs> yeah, he just like yeah, he just like cried and then drag him in there to nominate. <laughs> oh boy, most reluctant. Yeah, yeah, that was my that was my favorite part of that whole stream. That that whole anecdote, <laughs> the, the image of, of this old guy just just in tears after realizing he's he's gonna have to run <laughs> against a guy that won the fucking war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I, I I say won the war. I I I don't think Grant won the war. I think Sherman did. <laughs> That's I mean I don't know. I'm gonna be good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Grant Grant just Grant just did his best to, to make sure as many people died before before it ended. <laughs> I think though that um, the Democratic Party, it, it's the the party's really is in a shit situation though. Um, yeah. Because I mean, you have a party that. To its core, is riven by a war and a peace faction, and every party has factions. I mean, the Republicans have factions between like abolitionists, moderates, and then even conservatives in their party in terms of like they have the issue of race, and that's just that's just the issue of slavery. Um, but the, the 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 thing that separates that divides Democrats is much deeper than that. Uh, I always said if I designed a civil war game, what would happen is. If McClellan gets elected, most Civil War games say, okay, Confederates win. I was going to say, no, no, war keeps going. Um, but the Union's ability to wage it gets worse just because the Democratic Party would be such a clown show. So what would happen is... <laughs> oh, is God, that, I can imagine it. So I, my idea is that Northern... The, 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 sure, the war keeps going, but the longer McClellan's president the more the wheels just come off the thing. You know, kind of like um, the Trump-Biden, the Trump and Biden presidencies. <laughs> oh, boy. Like, oh, the longer oh, they're there, the more John, the wheels come off. <laughs> John, okay. Suggestion for, for, for you for a future project. You know those, like, fucking Peter Saras, like, short story collections with, like, like, fucking Dixie Victorious with all those, like, oh, oh, here's how the Confederates could have somehow fucking won the war. I want you to submit, uh, I want you to submit a uh, McClellan Becomes President story to, to that guy, and show, showing how that would have played out in your mind. That, that, that would have been, that would be a fucking ride. Man, yeah, I had to wonder who he put in his cabinet, you know, and how the generals would feel. But of one thing I'm certain, um, he is not negotiating with the Confederates at all. He wants victory. Uh, I don't know how he's going to handle... He's not going to... I don't think he'd send black soldiers away, but he'd probably say, I don't want them in combat anymore. And certainly the 13th Amendment is not getting put up. So, technically, slavery in that case could persist, but now he's in an entire other problem because you've freed all these slave emancipation proclamation. Um... Uh, are you just you know, going to revoke so, that now and just piss off a bunch of people that have guns? Exactly. So, you know, I think that that's why I'm trying to say, like, my, my game, if McClellan becomes president, oh, it's not great. You don't want it if you're the North. In fact, uh, you know, so I just think, like, the war is not just going to end. <laughs> so, you know, anyways. Um... So uh, let's go and do the Battle of Franklin and uh, call it yeah. quits here. Yeah. yeah, we've been going way longer than I expected. I was expecting this to end around one o'clock. Uh, well, you know, you know, you got the you got the tangents we have, which are fun. For <laughs> oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I, I I did a smart thing of taking like a three hour fucking nap between dinner and uh, nine thirty, uh, mm, okay. just, just for this fucking stream. <laughs> 
All right, sir. Franklin, take it away. All right. So, uh, November 30th dawns. Uh, Hood's pissed off with uh, what, what occurred at Spring Hill. And one of the people that he decides to blame for reasons he never fully explains, um, uh, probably because of what happens later that day, is Cleburne. Uh Along with Cheatham and a, co- and a bunch of others, but Cleveland's among them, despite the fact he, he did the least to, to fuck anything up here. Uh, Cleveland fi- finds out about this, and according to uh, John C. Brown, the the uh, infamous uh, guy in this whole debacle, uh, he said that uh, apparently uh, Cleveland was a bit disappointed by uh, this whole accusation against his honor. Uh and some people will say that this played a part in uh, what, uh, why he did what he did uh, later that day. Uh, so Shawfield reaches uh, Franklin and uh, and uh, starts digging in as uh, as the bridge across the uh, Harpeth River uh, behind the town was uh, deboarded at some point. And, and so they had to reboard it and send all their supply trains across. Uh, Hood's army starts arriving on, on, on the field uh, midday, and Cleveland rise up to, I believe, Winstead Hill and bar- borrows a uh, sniper scope to survey the enemy lines. Uh, and, and he takes notes of three. Uh, defensive lines ain't all manned, uh, according to uh, the account of uh, John O'Zane, the uh, air sniper he borrowed the, the scope from, allegedly. Uh, even though there was only two real lines, the uh, uh, the main line and uh, Wagner's uh, awkward forward position. Uh, Hood decides. Uh, Hood decides for reasons that are in contention to launch an attack. Uh, there, there's some merit to this, as uh, because of Wagner's exposed position, uh, he can be outflanked and routed quite easily. And uh, this is what what occurs. Uh, Cheatham's corps, with uh, uh, with Brown on the left and uh, Cleburne on the right, attack uh, against uh, Wagner's uh, division and rout them. Uh, Cleburne riding in on horseback. Uh, Orders his men to charge into the works, uh, fo- following in the uh, routing soldiers, who provide a shield to prevent uh, the men in the main line from firing into the Confederate line without fear of shooting their own men. This works to an, est- an extent, but parts of the, but uh, some men manage to uh, get to the line before the uh, Confederates do, uh, and in some parts they uh, the fields just open, and so devastating volleys start rolling in. Uh, Hiram Granbury is is uh, killed early on, and uh, Cleburne is uh, his horse is shot out from under him by a cannonball. Uh, he tries to get on another another horse, but that one's also killed, and so he charges his on so he charges in on foot. Uh, he goes into the smoke and is never seen alive again. He's found uh, after the battle, uh, by his own men. Who uh, discover he was about thirty-ish feet from the uh, front from the uh, enemy entrenchment, uh, shot through the heart allegedly. Uh, he apparently had his boot and uh, his uh, boots and swords stolen off of him, along with other accoutrements. Uh, but uh, his men recovered his body, and uh, he was interned at a uh, nearby uh, cemetery in Columbia. Uh, he was re- he was later moved uh, first to Memphis uh, due to his Irish roots in uh, 1867, and then later uh, he was reburied in Helena, Arkansas, where he uh, rests to this day. I forget exactly where, but uh, yeah. that is uh, the life and death of uh, Patrick Cleburne in a nutshell. Uh, All right. So, any more uh, yeah. notes we want to go off of, or? Honestly, I don't uh, I think most of uh, 
thoughts have been sprinkled up, uh, sprinkled around uh, uh, throughout. You know, the only thing I'd probably add is, oh, go ahead. I just had one question for you both. Uh, so early on, we talked about how Claiborne served in the, I guess, British Army for a bit. And yes. Mm-hmm. So I guess he would have learned drill and other things. How much of that did he try to bring with him when he was a commander? I mean, did he teach his soldiers British order drill, or did that play a role at all? Um, I think he retained some of it uh, early on when he was first forming his unit. Um, I, I'm not sure if he was uh, as well drilled on uh, as a uh, good as on teaching it himself as knowing it. Uh, I'd have to read through uh, Craig Simon's biography again uh, to see if he makes any mention of that exactly. Uh, but but uh, I, I will say the Confederate Army isn't as like stringently uh, rigid, I feel, as the British Army was in terms of uh, its discipline and, uh, and drill, especially yeah, in his division. Like, like he had, uh, like he was a discipliner. But I, I don't feel to the extent of you know uh, certain commanders, right? Yeah, he would have also been smart enough to realize that he couldn't. You couldn't get away with that, which you could do. And you know, increasing the British Army, you couldn't get away with it. Incre- well, not when he was in there. But you know, what I'm saying even the British Army is starting to undergo changes, especially after the Crimean War, and especially after yeah. the Duke of Wellington died. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. The good old Iron Duke. So, um, uh, yeah, it had some influence on the fact that he's a stricter disciplinarian than the rest. I've always heard that he had a very ramrod posture, which some people said they they put up to um, his uh, being in the British Army. Um, I know he wasn't a Finian, like you said, but he still had an Irish accent on him. Yeah. Um, yeah, though it seems to have uh, dissipated over time. Uh Yeah, maybe it would come out at certain points, though, because that's the thing about uh, Beauregard is some people would meet him would say they detected no French accent. Other times they'd be like, it'd be slight, and then they'd be like, oh, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, I my, my only last note on this, because we've been over pretty extensively and talked about, um, you know, mostly strengths. So the, some people detected some weaknesses. There was people like Lydell and Hardy who said they thought that Claiborne might have been a little... Um, uh, very procedural. I don't know how much Preen's put in that, but I think the reason, though, that Claiborne has his uh, his cult following is a combination of uh, really three things. Uh, military skill. He also becomes... He also doesn't get to arrive at Corps Command, so that question, you know, outside of Jonesboro, so that question is always asked, how would he do how he performed earlier, especially in an army that's so dysfunctional. And then particularly, you know, if you got those lost cause things, because, you know, I've had to read through so many issues of Confederate veteran, and, you know, they'll, or even just convert soldiers and veterans, especially officers writing years later, would talk about things like missed opportunities, like missed opportunities at Shiloh or Drury's Bluff, uh, Gettysburg. You know, like the one of the ones I read about in Drury's Bluff, the man said, Drury's Bluff. Another great what if for us, but the Lord ordained we were to lose. But, you know, if somebody wants to speculate, what would Claiborne be like in command? And, of course, there's also the proposal to end, um, to the proposal to uh, uh, have slave soldiers, to, to free slaves from military service. Um, I think all of these combined is what gives him more of a cult like status than, you know, I mean, most generals don't have that. You know, um, so I think that's all. I think that's all the things that's combined to create that with him. And the, uh, you know, there are other commanders in history who have similar attributes as well that can create a kind yeah. of cult. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking. Uh, I was considering like someday doing some weird uh, Plutarch rip off of you know Plutarch's lives, comparing you know. American figures to uh, classical ones, and, and, and I was considering, mm-hmm. uh, would it be a good fit to compare Cleburne to say Memnon of Rhodes, the uh, uh, the guy who opposed uh, Alexander and was proposing you know scorched earth tactics and such to uh, slow his advance? 
I would say no, because Memnon <laughs> had an independent command. Uh, but also, if you want yeah, to do, a, if you want to do a, a good um, comparison, Plutarch style, one thing would be to f try to find people who are more analogous in terms of their the times they live. Because the thing is, while there were centuries between a lot of the Greek and Roman subjects of Plutarch, the basic technological conditions are the same. So I think that makes a makes the comparisons more reasonable. And also I means societally there's still quite a bit of similarity. So if you wanted to do a Plutarch imitation, I'd say maybe compare Americans and Europeans from a about the same century or so. Yeah. To kind of yeah, capture point. the spirit. Yeah, not just technology, I mean culturally. Cultural stuff too. Um yeah, so that's that's yeah, that's that's what I would do as well. I mean you'd try to find um I think I think you could find somebody of a Claiborne type maybe in the American Revolution or the Napoleonic Wars. So that'd be my first thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, um, well yeah. You know, I'm I'm thinking what is it would Suche fit that fit that fit that bill considering uh he had a very different uh, style of command in the uh, in the peninsula than every other marshal uh, that we see. That makes sense to me. No. No. I it's would, not on the same level as I wouldn't put Suchet with that one. No, I'd want, what you'd want is somebody who you feel like has a level of frustrated ambitions who's a division commander. Oh, I knew I'd go with um, Friant or saint Hilaire, Two Napoleon division commanders. Oh, saint Hilaire uh, is never perfect. Made. St. Hilaire is perfect because he dies. Freon doesn't die, though, but he is, like, everybody agrees he's great, but nobody wants to promote him beyond division. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say those those two. Does um, one of them die anyways. in battle? Freon does, but St. Hilaire does. Yeah. Oh, well, St. Hilaire, then. Yeah. Yeah, that could, that, that, that would, uh, I mean, either one of them, but yeah, so... Yeah, Plutarch's, Plutarch's parallel lives, I've thought about a similar thing, but not comparing them to uh, ancient figures either. So, yeah, pretty cool, man. Yeah. Uh, I guess we should answer uh, Super Chats and uh, call a night, right? Yeah, we have a few here, so uh, let me pull them up. We have the first one from Zach Gilliam for $2. Thank you, Zach. He says, uh, Claiborne is one of the big what-ifs of the war. Well, I guess in terms of his proposal, certainly, and you know, had he gotten a core command that could have shaken things up for the Army of Tennessee. Although, I mean, it sounds like there was enough blowback once his proposal got out that uh, some of the officers might not have really accepted him. I don't know. They needed they needed somebody. I'd say if the proposal had any chance, they needed somebody with prestige. So. Even if guys like Lee and Beauregard are kind of talking about it, you know, they you need the advocacy of somebody like that. In the case of Beauregard, it wouldn't yeah. go anywhere just because of Davis, right? But, you know, it's still a man with political connections yeah. and still has, like, a lot of fans. So it needed to be somebody. It couldn't just be a division commander. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I still have another. Right. If you wanted to actually do the ancient parallel thing, like you are talking about earlier, Pug, uh, Gaius Laelius proposed doing land reform before the Gracchi, and then the Senate basically took him aside and said, no, we'd murder you if you try that. So then he said, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then he got the nickname, The Wise. <laughs> so maybe that could be a... Um, Gaius Laelius. Kind of okay, okay, okay. okay, you got to write that in a, in a wool chat, yeah, because I definitely will misspell that looking it up. Yeah, so anyway, uh, what were you saying? Um, I, I was gonna, I was gonna get at. Uh, I, I kind of agree with Sean. Uh, uh, I, I, I think the reason why the the uh, the slave soldier bill of eighteen sixty five got through the way it did was because because Lee openly endorsed it. Uh, of, of course, there's other factors involved. Of course, you know, uh, desperate situation, but. Uh, but given how close the uh, the whole vote was 
to get it passed in the first place, then yeah, uh, I, 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 I'd see, I'd see a, uh, if Lee did the same thing in the early 1864, it may not have gotten through, but it would have gotten way more traction than it should have if it, uh, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, it's the only chance it has. And, you know, you mentioned the, the thing with that. Let's say Beauregard agrees with Lee. Beauregard has a lot of political friends. So you'd have to have a combination of those two coming in to support the proposal. That might make it pass then. You know. Um, but, yeah, so... I actually, I'd actually be curious now I'm thinking about I have to look up uh, how the Confederate Congress, the members that I know that were at, allied to Beauregard, how they voted. I'd be curious to know. Um, but anyways, so, yeah, they, they, yeah, I love that episode, by the way, about the wise. <laughs> Just to say. <laughs> that was hilarious. Oh. It, cer- certainly, it certainly is. Yeah. So what's our next one? Next one comes to us from Nerb and the Maker for ten dollars. Thank you, sir. He says, "How would you guys rate Andrew Jackson as a general, or did he not have enough fights to make a clear assessment?" Also, what is a good book on the Southern theater of the Revolutionary War? Uh, I guess Sean, you said you've been writing about the Battle of New Orleans. So this is right up your alley. Yeah, uh, I was actually telling uh, Danny yesterday that uh, Jackson is not overrated. Uh, he's a fantastic commander. Uh, I'm not going to go with like military genius. I'm not putting him up there with Napoleon or Marlboro, but uh, he is aggressive, hard marching. He actually does handle his logistics. Pr- I mean, not great, but pretty well. Like good enough. Like his his men aren't all going hungry a whole bunch of times. Uh, he's very energetic. He's also judicious. 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 He could be very aggressive like a horseshoe bend, but then even after the Battle of New Orleans when he repulses the British, he decides not to counterattack, even though a few of his officers wanted to, but he understood that, yeah, his army was was his army was a good militia army. That's something to keep in mind with the Battle of New Orleans is that the men that he had, sure, they're militia, but a lot of them had experience in the Creek War. Uh, a lot of the New Orleans militia units included Frenchmen who had fought under Napoleon. Uh, he also has regu- trained regulars and Marines, so it, this is not like a. This is like you know the best kind of militia you can have. But even he knows that there's limits on what those guys could do. And he didn't know exactly how many men the British had, but he knew they hadn't thrown everything in. He could clearly see that in the plane. That's something to keep in mind too. You know, New Orleans is very flat, so you know he could you could see the british army's maneuvers and see that they still had formed regiments which they did and he's lucky it's a good thing he didn't attack because the two reserve regiments that didn't go in were the 7th and 43rd foot and those are both elite peninsular war veterans i think they would have made mincemeat out of jackson's men if they attacked so um, did any so, of the peninsular veterans actually go into the fight itself Yes, yes, a few. Um, Let me think here real quick. So the regiments that went in, you had the 93rd Highlanders, which were not Penciler veterans. They'd actually spent most of the time doing garrison duty in South Africa, but they were very well drilled and had high morale. And uh, a number of them had been in a battle in in Cape, the Battle of Cape Town. Um, You also had some Penciler veterans went in, on the attack on the on Jackson's right, and actually did penetrate the earthworks briefly, but there was no support that came up for them. Then you had Gibbs's attack. Oh yes, Gibbs had the fourth, twenty-first, and forty-fourth. The twenty-first and forty-fourth weren't Peninsular veterans, but they had fought in the War of eighteen twelve, and the forty-fourth had actually done well, although they do poorly in this battle. That's a whole other can of worms. The fourth. The 21st actually did better than the 4th, and the 4th was actually one of Wellington's elite regiments. And then on the other side of the river, the 85th went in. The 85th had also been the Peninsular War. So it's wrong to say that the Battle of New Orleans was a bunch of Wellington's veterans all being shredded to pieces. Most of the regiments were not, but several of them were. 
And you definitely have Peninsular War veteran officers like Keene, Packingham, uh, Lambert, although Lambert didn't go in. But anyway, you get my drift. It's And also, there were no, none of those British regiments were green. They all had seen action. If not in the peninsula, they had seen action in the War of 1812. Um, but no, Jackson is... Uh, uh, whatever flaws he has as a commander, what I find they have to do with is his personal tics. His personal flaws. Um, so, for instance, there was a guy named Morgan who fucked up on the West Bank royally. Jackson had his back the whole time. Why? Because when he first met him, he liked him. And also because when he first got to New Orleans, Morgan was one of the only militia officers who was actively strengthening the defenses of the city. So Jackson got there and was like, all right, when I got here, you were already working. I had to make you work. And uh, he was personally brave as well, even though the guy was a knucklehead. Uh, so, you know, Jackson could have his share of flaws, but Overall, excellent commander. Should also be noted that people will sometimes say that Jackson was like a natural general. And I think he was in many ways, but he was also, when he first became head of the Tennessee militia, you know, some of these militia guys just treated it as like, oh, whatever, I'll just do this and, you know, get promoted. And to be fair, your Tennessee and even your Kentucky militia did have militia commanders who took it a bit seriously, but Jackson took it really seriously. Like, he, he fought to be head of the Tennessee militia, when he was head of the Tennessee militia, he paid attention to a lot of details, and he read a lot about military art and science and theory and military history. So he took it very seriously as well. Uh, an example of that in the Civil War would be Richard Taylor. Sure, he didn't have any West Point training, but Richard Taylor, um, uh, many officers said that there was no other Confederate who knew as much military history as he, as he did. I'd say the only other one who might compare would be Beauregard. Yeah. Um, I've read. Actually, I think yeah. actually, I think Taylor knew more than Beauregard. I would say about military history. So, um, also, yeah, Jackson, fantastic commander. Uh, the second part of the question was uh, if there's a good book on the Southern theater for the, I guess, American War of Independence is what he meant. Yeah, um, there is one. I'm going to look it up right quick. Most books about the war, I've either read about individual battles, like I read a book about Guilford or. Or a campaign like Saratoga or New York. Um, so I haven't read too many like theater-wide books. I do know I find the Southern theater a lot more interesting overall. Yeah. But uh, you guys read any good uh, Southern theater books? I remember uh, long back, uh, back when I was still in high school, I like pulled out for the local library. I, I think it's... Uh, Something, something to Guilford Courthouse, uh, and it was about the uh, campaigns of Cornwallis uh, through uh, the Carolinas from uh, the siege of Charleston to uh, Guilford Courthouse and all the engagements in between. Uh, so most mostly about uh, you know the the, the guerrilla, uh, the uh, the backwoods conflicts uh, yeah. that occurred. Uh, so I think and, uh, my, yeah, my dad yeah. talked about that so, book uh, you're mentioning right now. I'm pretty sure he said he read it back in high school, and he always he always brings it up. Uh, do you know what the exact name of it? I I don't know, but I think it's some. I think it's to to Guilford's courthouse. Okay. Or the the road to Guilford Courthouse, or something, or something like that. I I, I I know that it's like something that it's like on the cut. The, the title is focuses on Guilford Courthouse, even though that's even though it's just one chapter near the end of the book. Like like it's the climax of the story, rather than uh, you know most other battle histories where they they fo focus multiple chapters on a single battle and just shove the uh, the uh, preamble and uh, aftermath uh, into the first and last chapters. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always really important to first understand the uh, maneuvers and also whatever the political context is for that particular battle. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Uh, we had one from Flavia Asanais for $2, and he just said, Good show, good chaps. Well, thank you, sir. 
and we have the last one from Brendan Samadi for $20. Thank you. He said, love the talk. As a native of Kansas, I will argue to Sean uh, that the first Kansas Colored Regiment was the first to see combat. Well, it was. Uh, yes, they were. The first to be in a skirmish. Uh, the first to be in a major battle is the first and third Louisiana Native Guards at Port Hudson. The first to see major combat. Ah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's right. They're, they are the first ones to be in a fight. That is true. But whichever way you look at it, guys, we're all living in the shadow of the 54th Massachusetts because of glory and because the abolitionist press covered them extensively. <laughs> but yeah. really, um, everybody's in the shadow of bait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was a very bulging man in his photos, let's say. I'm not, he's, he's not that uh, Davis guy that you guys talked about back in the the failed president's video. Let's, uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, but I, I, I will say, you know, reading up about uh, the first and the third Louisiana for... Uh, I, I was writing, actually, a paper about... Uh, the, the death of Andre Calu for a writing project, uh, doing some research on on that whole battle. It, it, it's just it's it's probably one of the saddest fucking episodes of the entire war. Just how half half assed and useless the whole thing was. Apparently, the commanding general there, Fort Dwight, uh, went on and on about how how this will be a great moment for for the history of of, of black people. It, and the night before the battle, he gets drunk and doesn't do reconnaissance of the front they're going to assault and tells them that there's no troops to their front. And they walk into an ambush yeah. in, a, in a slaughter pen. And, uh... Yeah. And, yeah. Dwight, Dwight, was a, Dwight was an intense alcoholic, you know, just... I've read some really hilarious things about him. He's one of the funniest fuck-ups in the Union Army. The only reason that, um... Banks kept him around and kind of even used him as an unofficial advisor. I've I've found out is because Dwight came from a wealthy Massachusetts family, and where's Banks from? Massachusetts. So you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty sad. So what you write in a paper on Calu or what is it? I, 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 well, well, uh, they they well the writing project uh, it had something to do with you know creative nonfiction. I was thinking, you know what? Mm. You know, I haven't talked about my personal problems all these people so far. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna write about something falling back on my like history studies, and so I'm, uh, so I decided to write about this. I decided to write about Andre Calu and point out, you, you know, this 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 whole war is way more fucking complicated than you guys can even conceive of, even even on this fucking level. Because holy shit, there's like. Hmm. The, the Louisiana yeah. Native Guard is probably the weirdest fucking unit I have ever fucking read about in all of military history. It's a bizarre one. It's a bizarre one. Um, yeah, KU is buried uh, how many blocks away from me? Like six, seven blocks away from me? He's buried in uh, St. Louis Cemetery Number 2. Uh, yeah, it's a bizarre unit. Probably... Worth one of its own discussions. Just talk about odd Civil War units. Um, they're totally up there, of course. Yeah, I'm curious about those uh, <laughs> Union Lancers that they organized, I think, in Pennsylvania or somewhere. Oh, this the Russia's Lancers? Oh, yeah, I love those guys. Mm -hmm. now, the, the thing is, they never used their Lancers in combat. The only Lancer unit I that ever fought in combat was uh, one of the Texas... The 5th Texas Cavalry, which fought at... Uh, uh, it was in Battle of New Mexico. It wasn't Glorieta Pass. It was the one before Valverde. Yeah, Valverde. Yeah. Yeah, and that didn't go too well, which is why they stopped using those lances. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah, no, it's... Um, but yeah, no, uh, that would be... Uh, that'd be a good one. I'm, uh, we're, uh, I'm, working on a, I'm working on a Port Hudson book right now. The uh, draft is... Um, first draft was finished... And I'm just getting all the pictures together and getting some appendix pieces. And I'll have a whole thing on the uh, Native Guards and, of course, going into uh, KU's death as well. Um, 
And that book, I've got a lot of Dwight anecdotes because he's just too, um, it's, just, it's just too good to pass up. All right. Well, I guess that is that. I think we've done our due diligence for the evening. Uh, I've actually got to get back to work, even though it's 2.40 in the morning. Yeah, we, we went way later than I was expecting. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, I've still got to record three more lectures for this week for one of my classes. Obviously, I'm not going to do all of them tonight, but maybe oh, one more. Uh, anyway. But, uh, yeah, thank you all, all for right, joining guys. us, and uh, thank you, Pug, for coming on. And um, what are we going to do next week? I don't know, man. We'll figure it out in a few days. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, either. I don't know. All right. I do know what's going on. Anyway, night, guys. All right, good night. Good night. Thank you all. All right, we're off the air.